Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Bob Beeman. I'd like to take a few minutes to outline the purpose and intent of our public hearing tonight, as well as set guidance for how we're going to proceed. This hearing is an opportunity for the select board to hear from our neighbors and community members. Our role this evening is to be active listeners. We will not be taking physical evidence, maps, documents, etc. We will not be engaging in discussion or deliberation. There will be no actions taken tonight or any decisions made. Those conversations have already occurred at many planning council meetings and at several select board meetings. If someone speaking at the microphone has a technical question regarding the bylaw amendment being discussed, we will ask the planning council chair, Etienne Hancock, hi Etienne, and or Todd Thomas, our zoning administrator, raise your hand, you guys, uh, to provide an answer. Our intent is to have Todd read a bylaw change proposal that topic will be, will be open to the floor for comment. Those who wish to speak to the bylaw amendment being presented will come up to the microphone, identify themselves with a full name, and identify the town where you live. You will be given two minutes from that point to speak to the select board. Please direct all your comments or questions to myself. You may only speak once per bylaw amendment. Those participating through Zoom will be recognized by me to present their opinion. The same guidelines for time apply in Zoom as well. And chat will not be utilized tonight. Instead, use the raise your hand function to be recognized and we'll get to you. In the interest of time, I reserve the option to end discussion of any bylaw amendment given the other board members support me by quorum. This is uh, if, you know, if 10 people are coming to the microphone to say the same thing and it goes on and on, that's when we'll, we'll stop. So having said that, I'm going to open the public hearing zoning bylaws to discuss the changes to the zoning bylaws with planning council present. Go ahead, Doug. Everyone hear me okay? So my apologies to those of you who have heard this before, but uh, we're going to go through the zoning bylaw, hopefully uh, one final time here, uh, proposal by proposal, and hopefully ferret out any last questions or concerns. I'm going to pause for comments at the end of each section. So right on that page you have, you'll see it starts with section 201. That's what we're going to start with, and I'm going to go right down the line for each zoning bylaw change as proposed. So without further ado, section 201, uh, the Planning Council has agreed to add detail and edit boundary line description language uh, to give some background on that. Uh, zoning boundary lines often split lots, uh, split sections of town, and when there's a question as to what a property, does it lie in zone A or zone B, this gives better detail as to where the DRB should look to make that interpretation. And generally, this language is being strengthened so the boundary line description follows natural features, rivers uh, and ravines, th things like that. Any questions on section 201? Uh, can I interrupt you for a sure. second? I just wanted to remind folks that if you want to go on record as being here tonight, you need to sign um, the uh, sign-in sheet in the back of the room. We saw some materials in the room back there. Uh, please do that. OK. So any questions on section 201? Pretty straightforward, just clarifying existing language and strengthening existing language. All right, going, going, sold, gone. Uh, section 204.4, the, Ron. Question mark. Yes. You didn't let me tell you what it was first. Ron Stankler. <clears throat> As proposed, I, uh, the DRB may reduce up to 25% of any dimensional or numerical requirement provided the waiver request can be found to meet at least the two following goals. <clears throat> what I don't like about it, <clears throat> number one, is the 25%. The, uh, for, since the beginning of time of the zoning, which is in the 1970s, it was 15%. 
And then due to some circumstances on Maple Street about two years ago, the select board, the previous one to the board now, changed it to 25%. What's bad in doing this is that 25% applies to the whole damn town and not just Maple Street. I'd like it go back to 15% or even lower. The other thing is, the way it says any dimensional or numerical can be waived. And I think it should exclude lot size, building height, access right away, and minimum areas per family from waiver consideration. Thank you. Any other comments on section 204.4? So currently, 204.4 is written as a list of things that DRB can waive. And the language is simplifying it, basically allowing the DRB to waive any dimensional numerical requirements. So there's not a question. If it's on the list, can the DRB waive it or not waive it? So the intent is to give the DRB the discretion of the proposed zoning bylaw change. And to, to Mr. Stancliffe's comments, the waiver percentage, 25%, there's no warrant change here. The select board changed that a few years back. So that's not something we can change as part of the zoning update. Yes, Nancy. Uh, Nancy Banks, Elmer Mountain Road. Uh, question I have is, does that preclude them from putting conditions on the approval? It doesn't. Well, sorry, that was loud. It does not. So under current statute and as proposed, the Development Review Board does have the ability to put conditions on understanding, of course, that a developer could choose to go to court and say, we challenge those conditions, but they have the right to put conditions. Yes, I've actually never, that's correct. I've never seen the DRB not condition a waiver. They're always conditioned. Okay. Any other questions on section 204.4? Yes, yes, Judy. I understand dimensional, but I don't understand numerical. Numerical. The way the, the zoning bylaw is written, it's just to be as obtuse as possible to say any dimensional and numerical uh, requirement that's proposed. So there was a question of, I think it was lot size a few years ago, and the DRB, it's not named in there. Can we, can we waive lot size? The intent is the DRB can waive 25% of any zoning requirement. So it's, it's maybe wordier than it needs to be, but it's meant to be all-encompassing. That's umbrella language, pretty much, if that makes sense. You. You're welcome. Yeah. David Ring, I'd like to address the board. Uh, when you opened up this meeting, you stated that you were going to listen to all these comments from the public, but then you aren't going to do anything about it. <clears throat> Isn't that what you said, that you aren't going to make any changes? You just I said that no action will be taken. No action will be taken. David, the, the select board cannot statutorily legally act tonight. They're here to listen. That's all they can do legally. Okay. They can't make any actions. So should we also enter written comments to that effect? You know, you're taking these thoughts and these opinions from people, but do you need written uh, comments that, that you could address too? If you like, it's all recorded. I think you address that in your script. Yeah. Okay. I thank you. Well, I, I second Ron's uh, suggestion of, of keeping the, uh, or even reducing this, uh, this waiver uh, criteria. And it is very, very confusing in that it states uh, reduced to 25%. It doesn't really say maximums or, or other uh, uh, information. It just says uh, starting from zero and reduced to 25%. You know, it's, it's confusing. So... And I would like to submit something in writing, which I had before, but I'll submit it again. Thank you. Kevin Lane, Bud City Loop. Did I hear that it's gone from 15 to 25 percent? That is correct. That happened maybe five years ago. And that it was the select board that changed it from 15 to 25? That is correct. So that makes me wonder who the plan who is in charge of planning? The select board and trustees are. Planning in Vermont has no statutory power. Uh, they 
formulate proposals and it goes to the select board and trustees for approval. For the waiver percentage in question, the planning council voted no. The select board overrode the planning council and changed the waiver. Okay. Thank you for so clarifying the, that. The buck stops at this board and the, this board for the town, the village trustees for the village. They need to act in unison together to change zoning. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And then what's the purpose of the development review board? If you have the planning commission on one hand, you have the trustees. David, you've already spoken on this issue. Sorry. Any other comments on section 204.4? I'd like to, uh, Bob Mortry, I live on Randolph Road in Morrisville, and I'd, I'd like that question answered. Uh, what is the purpose of the Development Review Board if what they propose has no teeth? I, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. It, um, probably 95% of the time, we go along with whatever they give us for their recommendation, whether it's, whether it's a planning board or any board, the DRB. There's also a lot of things, you know, state mandates that we can't control and the DRB can't either. But most of the time, we go along with what they recommend to us. If, uh, if we don't, it's, that's an anomaly. It's not, not very obvious. Mr. Bortree, structurally, the, the planning council proposes the rules. The select board and the village trustees have to approve them. Once they're approved for a large project, the Development Review Board works with the developer to interpret them and approve the projects. So planning starts to write the rules, to, to uh, draft the rules, the select board and trustees approve the rules. The DRB is a totally separate board that approves large projects. So my understanding then is their two and a half or two and a quarter years worth of work is sitting in front of everybody right now. Correct. That is gonna be voted on no December 5th or thereabouts. So my question is, you could strip out parts of that and the, the village trustees could strip out parts of that and what are we left with? I, I guess. It, it could happen. The select board is and the trustees are, they, they punch the ticket here. They're the ultimate approval authority. Generally, as Bob said, the select board does I would say 90% of the time approve what's proposed. They do tend to strip things out, at least generally once a zoning bylaw, but it's one part of a much larger package that gets stripped out. So it's uh, generally pretty minor, or the majority of proposals get approved, only a few things don't make it to the final approval table. I've only seen, I've been on the board 15 years, and I've only seen less than, less than five times that we have not gone with what was recommended. Very, very rarely. I think you could also say that there's a limit. Can, can I make one follow up question regarding that? So, my understanding is that it has to be approved by the trustees and the select board. So, what? So, this comes down to a negotiated settlement, so to speak, of the proposal in front of you. So, the trustees don't like part of it, you don't like part of it. Uh, how does that get resolved? That's true. That's very true. And sometimes, sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes the trustees don't like it. But it's kind of like you, you have to negotiate between the trustees and, and our board. I've never liked that about the process, but that's just the way it is because it has to be decided between the trustees and the select board. So you're definitely right about that, Bob. Because we're still Morrisville and Morristown, it's a two-part approval process. The trustees have the control zoning in the village. The select board controls zoning in the town. However, we have a joint zoning bylaw. So if one board objects to, even the trustees can object to the town or the select board can object to the village, if there's not that compromise language that gets through, none of it passes. Both boards have to approve the language exactly the same for it to be in our Morrisville, Morristown zoning bylaw. It only gets simpler if we become one town and further merge, which is not on the agenda tonight. Uh, my name is Tom Pudi, and I just have one question. If all this is going to have to be approved, what you got here, why are we here? You're going to just hear us talk, and nothing's going to, what we say seems like it's not going to matter. It's what you guys, and then if you don't like it or do like it, it doesn't matter if the trustees don't like it. What are we doing here? 
Most of the time, well, you need, need the yeah. yeah, most of the time when when um, people come and they give us their opinion, we take that opinion. And, and that is most of the time when we might make a decision that's not recommended to us by the Planning Council or the DRB. And I know it's the same way with the trustees. In your you know. 15 years, how many times have you done that, changed it? Not very many. That's what I'm getting Not at. very many. Um, to the question about submitting um, <clears throat> written um, opinions, um, in my experience when we were all looking at the town plan, which was my only other experience with a hearing like this, um, I did listen really closely to um, people who spoke up and um, people who um, emailed um, their, um, just in a nutshell, like a few sentences. Um, what they were proposing or what they were worried about. Um, it was much easier to look back later. Um, I take copious notes um, and it is important to me that I am representing um, the people of um, Morristown and Morrisville um, who did elect me as an elected official. So I want to let you know that I am listening and um, taking what you're saying to heart. And I think the reason that we're not making decisions tonight is so that we can actually deliberate. I mean, that's the idea. I'm going to move on to section 204.5a. Uh, if we're getting pretty far away from the waiver question, if that's okay with everyone. So section 204.5a, we're doing a very simple revision of the use matrix to clarify the special industrial use, which is kind of the agricultural, I mean, the uh, ag use, ag being aggregate, not agriculture, uh, on the Wolcott side of Garfield Road and making a small change. So site plan approvals go through site, go through, uh, Site plan approval for large projects instead of conditional use. So it's just a uh, structural change for how the DRB approves large projects. So pretty minor revision there. Any questions on this? I have a question. Yes, Judy. Um, oh, well, the top of the mic. I'm Ron Stancliffe again. Uh, hold on, Ron. Hold on. Um, I think I understand what the P means in the um, in the grid in the matrix. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure if I know what the C means. So Conditional. Yes. Yeah, so when you look at the matrix, if you're going to build a garage or a single family home, those are generally things I approve. I approve smaller projects, sometimes with bigger things downtown, but generally small projects. In the matrix, the C is conditional, means it goes to the DRB for review. So that's the difference between the P and the Z. P means simple permit. You come to the zoning administrator, he or she gives you a permit, you stick the P sign on your fence, and your neighbors have 15 days to appeal. The other, for generally reserved for larger projects, is the DRB hearing uh, with a 15-day warning for conditional use, seven days for site plan review, and then a 30-day appeal period. And then all the neighbors get written invitation to attend. Ron, go ahead. I guess I don't understand <clears throat> what is meant by larger projects when rural residential is a two-acre minimum. And now, by adding a conditional use, it sounds like we're getting away from what the rural residential area is. And I don't believe just because that's a particular area of special um, zone is that now it could apply for the rural area in the rest of the whole town, which the most, most of the town is rural residential agricultural. To me, it looks like there's already some kind of planning going on up there for large projects that hasn't even, <clears throat> well, down the road is going to get before the DRB. Anyway, I believe I would like that conditional use struck and we stay with the original planning, original zoning. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, what is an example of um, special industrial? Uh, so Ron's talking about the other half of it. Special industrial is the aggregate operation or the concrete batch plant. Those are, uh, those, there's no, all we're doing is clarifying the use matrix. There's no use change. Everything's on the east side, the Wolcott side of Garfield Road and north of the river. That's our large industrial zone where people can make big noises and run large operations and where houses aren't really dense there. So minimal disruption. The other part, this is really a very simple change. 
We're changing them from site plan review from conditional use for large projects. Large projects are defined as 20,000 square feet or more in footprint. That's unchanged, that's in the zoning bylaw. So basically, instead of site plan, instead of conditional use, it's going site plan or approval. It's just meant to make it a little easier for the board to deal with large projects. Any other questions on uh, section 204.5A? 204.5A. All right, I'll move on to section 204.5B. This includes one of the larger changes of the evening. So 204.5B uh, edits the dimensional table and adds Lower Brooklyn Street, the west side, to the HDR zone. Well, the HDR zone comes later. It's adding the Brooklyn Street zoning change and giving them the same density as M MDR with that eight foot uh, front setback minimum. It's been talked about extensively, the Brooklyn Street change. Any comments on the Brooklyn Street change? This is one of the places we see it. We'll see it further again at the end of this, end of this under section 1000. Hi, Jennifer Faith, a Brooklyn Street property owner who is has been adversely affected by a change that to my understanding was made by the select board four or five years ago when um, many of the, or several of the properties, including mine, it's now non-conforming. Um, we are in a um, multifamily area, and at some point it was changed several years ago to my, with my understanding, to single family. I am now trying to sell our property. We have been trying since spring, and it's been tied up in this zoning, and so I'm here to support the change to multifamily. If you look at that area of Brooklyn Street, it is mostly multifamily. And I'm asking, it seems like we need to right a wrong. And um, I'm asking for that to be changed. So in my case, our property can be sold. Thank you. Any questions on West Side or Brooklyn Street? No? I feel like this one's pretty well understood by now. All right, so moving on. Um, section 206, add exterior access, outdoor space, flat roof, and lighter requirements to design criteria. So section 206 and section 207 are really some of the major changes for this zoning change. Uh, talking about them largely together, lumping them in together, we are adding uh, many new requirements for development in our downtown. Section 207 is mainly towards the downtown historic district, which is our commercial core down here, Lower Main, Portland, Pleasant, Hutchin, Hutchins Bridge. Section 206 has a little bit longer tentacles. It does go out into the high density residential zone. Uh, it is adding um, exterior access requirements, outdoor space requirements uh, for multifamily uses in that zone. So for example, it's meant to, in the areas outside the downtown, really drive the developer towards proposing townhouses instead of larger apartment buildings. So that exterior access, every unit has to have a ground floor access, a front door or a back door at ground level. I mean, doesn't, so you're not going to see a larger building with, an, with one doorway and internal staircase up to multiple floors that doesn't meet the zoning. If this is proposed, this is approved as proposed. It has a, each unit, so townhouse style has a ground floor access. That's the main part. Also, we're adding in for the first time on section 206, outdoor space. Uh, I believe every unit has to have 24 square feet of outdoor space per unit. We don't have that right now. Yes. Uh, Leah Bronner, Jersey Way. Um, I appreciate the outdoor space, outside space, and I would really um, encourage the select board to be thinking about the quality of life for people in um, very high buildings. Um, exterior access just makes it a lot easier having lived in different kinds of condos, high rise and how difficult it is to um, just get fresh air. So um, um, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Leah. Any other questions on section 206? Bob? Yes. I'm, I'm wondering how maybe this is not the right section that is, this is discussed in, but um, I'm wondering how parking is being dealt with. Um, 
this, there's no parking changes planned tonight. So parking overall okay, is. So this is not on the. Uh, I'll give you the 10 second recap though. Happy to. Uh, parking everywhere in town is two spaces per housing unit, except in right in the downtown in the high density uh, zone right outside the downtown, it's one space per unit. So two spaces per unit and probably 94% of the land area in this town and in 6% of the land area, which is right where we are downtown and the immediate neighborhoods right around it, a couple blocks around it, it's one space per unit. So my understanding from that comment then is that none of what is being proposed by the Development Review Board to the Select Board. Planning Council the Select Board. Has anything to do with parking? Correct, no parking changes are proposed. No parking changes. Okay, I guess this doesn't get discussed tonight then. Thank you. Any other questions on section 206? All right, let's go to 207. Uh, it's companion zoning change. This is more concentrated in the commercial core in the Morrisville Historic District. So we're adding historic preservation criteria and physically protecting many contributing historic buildings what's remaining in our historic district. Uh, that's the last section of 207, which is probably the most meaningful piece, which hasn't been talked about a lot. So um, this proposal dictates, well, the proposal is really to back up for a minute. We're trying to not add another layer of government and have a design commission like some uh, historical design commission, historical design review, like some towns have. We're trying to get prescriptive requirements that the developer, the administrator such as me, or the development review board can look at and say, this meets the code or doesn't meet the code. So what 207 is, it's prescriptive requirements, corner board width, freeze boards, trim boards, all of those little details that may seem small, but architecturally they make a big difference to a building being a good looking building or a building not quite passing that test. So. That's what section 207 is. This is the probably the biggest piece of the zoning tonight meant for the historic district downtown. And this is the planning council responding to people. Now that we have, it took a long time to get development, people interested in developing in Morrisville. Now that we have that, we're turning up the simmer a bit on the oven to make sure the buildings we're getting downtown really look good and have a long-term lasting value and really add to the fabric of our built environment as opposed to uh, not or even detracting from that. So that's the main section, main part of 207. Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just have a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Nancy Banks, 890 Elmore Mountain Road. Um, and I asked this before, but now you probably have a better answer. How many projects have already been approved that are in the pipeline that are gonna take down historical buildings in the town? I mean, I think, because I think the confusing thing is that when some additional structures go up, people are gonna be very surprised because they're gonna say, well, we passed new zoning laws and I know you were really clear as to when they took effect. So my question is how many are in the pipeline and is there a, a sunset clause on those uh, projects that have been approved? The pipeline's pretty short. 8% interest rates does that to a pipeline. So this time last year, the tunnel, a pipeline, there wasn't much light at the end of the tunnel. Now there's clear light at the end of the tunnel. I don't have a lot of large projects coming in I think now that we passed the pandemic era in uh, turbocharged cheap money with at the low, uh, low interest rates caused, we got a lot of development at once and I think we're moving past that and normalizing now with the interest rates. So um, of the projects that have taken down historic buildings, some buildings, some, I mean, the historic district has all buildings listed in it. Some have merit, some do not. And even some that are listed as contributing structures are some, maybe you wanna say, maybe you don't. As an example, the Arthur's redevelopment, where Pizza Main and Black Cap is, that took down, I believe it was the Shampoo building on the far left. That was an historic, a contributing building in our historic district. Uh, Fenimore Street, the new townhouses down there along the backside mm -hmm. of Route 100 in the river, those took down contributing structures in the historic district. They were sheds, largely. And I don't think anyone wanted to preserve the sheds there. So if you look at the last set part of 207, that's where we actually state which buildings by number have to remain for at least the facade and 30 feet in depth and which, which buildings we can, we've deemed are, we can lose in the historic district. So there are contributing structures and non-contributing structures. And of those contributing structures in section 207, that last little paragraph, we've, we're saving most of them from being further raised. But we have in the, so any project that was submitted before these were approved, um, how many projects 
we're in the pipeline and is there any sunset clause on when does a developer get those rights forever or does those rights sunset? We'll actually talk about that shortly. So a developer, once they submit a permit and really it wasn't, it's not in the approval, it's when this hearing was worn, when the select board and trustee right. has worn the paper, that's the cutoff. The new zoning is actually, all this we're talking about is already in effect. We're already right. living under it. I interview projects under the new zoning and the old zoning, which is wonderful. It's the two sets of rules. But the, um, so everything on the DRB for this Wednesday, for example, is under the old zoning. And I have a couple more projects on my desk, small subdivision and a, a large subdivision and a couple smaller subdivisions under the old zoning. Uh, but everything else, the other the development projects, everything other than what's on the DRB this Wednesday will be under the new zoning unless the new zoning is not approved. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Tyler on the Tyler and Zoom, please feel free to voice your question, opinion. You guys hear me all right? Yep. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, apologize. Quick question was uh, would the development review board or you be able to waive any of the uh, requirements in the historic uh, in the historic downtown district. Is there a process for that, or what would that look like? That is a good technical question. I have to look at Etienne. You're know off the top of your head. Wait, what is the DRB allowed to waive in Section 207? I don't think much. Uh, let's see. Under Section 207I. Other than the waiver specified under section 207.3C for preferred building materials, the zoning administrator and DRB shall not waive any of the section 207.3 requirements unless it is specifically needed for the rehab of a certified rehabilitation under the U.S. Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation as regulated by the National Park Service 30 CFR 67, the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation. The owner must produce the re historic re rehabilitation plan, the approval letter from the noted agencies requiring the use of any non-conforming materials or features. So basically, other than the, the facade materials, uh, the types of, uh, types of clapboards or maybe trim or materials or material choices, the DRB can't waive much of there unless it's really called out by the Department of the Interior and the federal government for the rehab of a certified historic building. So it's pretty strict. Sir, I see you wave in there. Can you come to the microphone, please? As I instructed earlier, you come to the microphone, introduce yourself. Where you're I'm Al Morrison. I live on Audie Lane. What is your criteria now for determining a historic structure? And the reason I ask is they recently knocked down an older house on Route 100, almost across from our road, and they put up a 16-unit apartment house where that, plus another one in the back where that house set. Now I don't know whether that's classified as a whole, as a historic structure under your criteria, it but it not. was one of the older buildings. It is not the the in section the area. 207 requirements are really just the core of downtown, the commercial core, Lower Main, Portland, the Route 100 section of Bridge Street, Hutchins. So you're Pleasant. you're only concerned about the nucleus of the village. Correct, that's, that's the okay. proposal. Thank you. The proposal actually has um, the existing zoning has Jersey Heights as regulated under section 207. That's being removed as part of the zoning change. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other, well, I lost my notes, I need those. It's a lot to remember. Any other questions on section 207? All right, hearing none. Uh, section 340, uh, via Conservation Commission proposal, we're adding new steep slope protections and making other edits to the environmental resources area. So really, Section 340, uh, with a new steep slope protection, is getting an entire rewrite. So any questions on that? Go ahead. Uh, this is the first I've heard of it, but it just brings up the question. Oh, sorry, Laura Green, Morrisville. Um, how does that affect some of the new proposed buildings like uh, where Cheney's house was that 
nine unit or whatever, you know, that's right on a. It doesn't affect place. anything in the uh, already under, already been permitted or applied for. So mm -hmm. a developer who submits their uh, permit application prior to his zoning change being warned uh, is grandfathered under the old rules. So it doesn't affect anything. But this has, the steep slopes has wide impacts all over town. Uh, the, uh, the impacts, I have to go read them off the top of my, I can't do them off the top of my head. So if I do steep slopes under section 340, so the, uh, it regulates slopes from less than 20%, from 20 to 25%, and then slopes of 25% or greater. I don't have a slope map with me, but if you look at a slope map, um, that's what's on the orange and red areas on the slope map, and they're all over town. They're especially, obviously, if you head up the mountain, they're steeper there, but there are ravines all over town that would be protected by this proposed zoning. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And the zoning, this change was edited by the Planning Council. It used to regulate private driveways and utility infrastructure, and that those two sections were stripped out before this proposal became came to the select board and trustees for approval. I keep doing that. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions on steep slopes? Speak now or hold your peace on that one. Thank you. All right, moving on. Section 402.1, 402.1, not fun. Um, for, for, sure, go ahead. Um, can you speak to how um, the the steep slopes change um, uh, dovetails with changes we made to the town plan? Because I know that was a, a big question, a big ask on the part of um, the Morristown Conservation. It's largely uh, the next step is to the town plan. So we've never had steep slope regulations before. Mm -hmm. And the town plan suggest that was approved back in May. I think it's May or April. Uh, suggest that we could do that. You can't have zoning unless it's in the town plan. So the town plan okay. sets the foundation. This is us building that house okay. uh, around our steep slope regulation. So we're regulating slopes for the first time. Great. <laughs> uh, moving on, section 402.1. Uh, we're just clarifying the language here for uh, ZA discretion on renewals. Uh, basically, it's regarding expired permits. So pretty technical. Any questions on 402.1? Can someone have a question about that? Steep slopes? No, but the, but the permits running out. Sure. So. Yeah, so any permit, um, whether it's a, a backyard shed, a new house, or a new downtown building, they're good for two years, and it can be extended for eight more years. So um, that's at the discretion. If, for example, Let's say a permit under the old zoning is allowed to expire. The developer lets it expire. And I'm not going to renew that permit if the new zoning is going to require changes from it. So if they have a permit and they get it under the old pre-207, let's say it's on Hutchins Street or let's say it's on Pleasant Street. We're on Pleasant Street now. Uh, if they apply under the old zoning and there's nothing applied on Pleasant Street under the old zoning, uh, that's actually that's not true. Next door is. So just hypothetically Pleasant Street, if there's something under Pleasant Street under the uh, a permit, they let it expire. I will not renew the permit. I'll make them reapply so they fall under the new zoning. But otherwise, if there's no change, it doesn't. it's not a good use of the applicant's time or my time, which is taxpayer time, to renew the permit process for the same permit to do it over again. So I'll generally renew a permit unless there's a major zoning change that would give me pause on doing so. And I can always send it to the DRB, which I've done before. Any other questions on 402.1? I'm going to move to 40, section 405. End harsher treatment of zoning for corner lots and clarifying waiver allowance. So right now, if you have a corner lot, you basically get uh, double taxation, I like to call it. You're not, it's not talking about taxes, but the front setback is usually your most onerous setback. If you're a corner lot, you have two front setbacks right now. So there is a, the, the, the onus for this change came on for a lot on the corner of James Way and Hool Avenue. Uh, the Hool Avenue property has been there for many years. It's a World War II era uh, ranch style home. And James Road, which is the road to Green Mountain Support Services and something else down there. Green Mountain and uh, the school, East yeah, the East Meadow School. That road came in after that. So these people had a lot that wasn't a corner lot. A new road comes in and suddenly they lose their ability to use their side yard because they have a new front setback. Because the side setbacks in that zone are 10 feet but the front setbacks are 50 feet from the center line of the road. So suddenly they lost a chunk of the yard and they couldn't 
uh, they had a hard time building a garage there under uh, without the zoning change. So this will give people back the use of their land on corner lots. So they'll still have to meet the, like everyone else does, we all have a front setback, we meet the front setback. This will make sure people don't get two front setbacks. Any questions? Nope. Uh, section 415, remove measurement of yard area from home business allowance. So uh, the, the genesis of this change came from a home business for a uh, doggy daycare. I believe it was down on Fitzgerald Road. And the DRV was unsure if the fenced in area the dogs ran in would count against the 25% the requirement. So this clarifies that where we don't have to stick the dogs in a tiny area to meet the 25%. A yard, if, if it's a yard, is not part of the home business calculation. It's really about structures. It's not about yard area. And the question on this one was, is it yard area because it was fenced in? So the DRB decided to actually include the yard area so the dogs have a smaller run than they probably should. This will fix that going forward. Come on up. Come on up, Al. Al Morrison again. When you say remove measurement of yard area from a home business allowance, a home business, is there a spe specific home business allowances, home businesses that are allowed, or is any home business allowed? It's any home business. So the analogy I like to give people explaining this okay. is there's a home occupation and a home business. Let's say I make wicked good cookies and my so, cook. So maybe I'm not reading this correctly, but this would say that you could. You could have your home business boarding right up to my line. That can happen now, yes. Right. So if you've got a home business that makes a mess of your, your yard, you could make a mess right up to my property line, and I can't do anything about it. Well, there's still a setback, so they can't build structures in the setback. All this is basically saying okay, is... Okay, so it, if you, any home business still ha has to meet the setback requirements... For structures, in yes. ...in that zone. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, to explain what I was trying to explain real quickly is uh, if I make really good cookies as a home occupation, let's say I use my kitchen at my house and I package the cookies up, they're sold off-site. They're sold to Hannaford's, they're sold to Price Chopper. Uh, that's a home occupation. I'm using a portion of my home for a business, but no business is being conducted there. That's a home occupation. A home business is the more intense use of residentially zoned private property for a business use. So my cookies are amazing. They're the greatest cookies in the world. Uh, but, and so people are lining up in my house and selling them out the window. People can't get enough of them. And because of that, it's creating traffic in a residential neighborhood and business is being conducted in a residential neighborhood. That's a home business. So home occupation is generally allowed by right. A home business goes to the zoning board for approval and they have to make sure that even though my cookies are really good and people want them all the time, they the DRB will set reasonable hours of operation, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, 9 to 2 on Saturday, generally no Sundays. So that's the higher use is the home business use. And this is just saying, what counts under a home business for the 25%, what doesn't. The 25% to get at the larger explanation is the section of your property that can be used for a home business. So if I have a 2,000 square foot house, uh, let's say I don't have any barn, I don't have a garage, I just have a house, I can only have 25% of that for a home business, so 500 square feet. So it's a pretty small home business. So my cookies is gonna, my cookie shop, if it's not in my house, is gonna be a little shed out in the backyard. I'm limited by my house size. I can't be more than 25% of my house size. But this would basically say for the dog kennel business, the dog kennel itself has to be 25%, but we can let the dogs run the yard greater than 25%. Their dogs let them run. That was the change the DRB made. So the DRB was trying to say, well, it says 25%, has to be the dog kennel and the yard has to be less than 25%. So the poor dogs only got this tiny little kennel that's 500 square feet when there's plenty of yard to run in. That's all we're trying to change here. Yes, hi. <clears throat> Mariah Stokes, Sterling Valley Road. Um, as you were giving that beautiful analogy, Todd, my mind floated to a place that I haven't been able to find where it's gonna be discussed, so I'm just gonna kinda of edge that in there for a minute. Um, does that mean that short-term rentals, people who are utilizing their homes as business rentals and lodging would fall under this no, home we, business? No, actually, uh, Vermont's uh, Supreme Court says you have to treat short-term rentals as a residential use of the property, so it's not a business use. We'll definitely talk about short-term rentals at length later, but not, not the- not Okay, the is there one. a number to that? Yeah, it's actually part of the, the definition changes. It's section 1000. Okay, all right. Uh, section 900, sorry. Okay, thank short -term you, Short-term housing, no problem, happy to help. And by the way, I'm, like, I'm not a good baker. My cookies aren't very good. 
So don't come to the house for those. You'll be solely, you'll be surprisingly disappointed. Uh, so next one, section 422. Uh, right now only the DRB can approve lots accessed by 20 foot right of ways, um, one or two. Anything more than one or two houses is a 50 foot right of way. So basically in a nutshell, your driveway is probably, most people's driveway here is probably 14 feet wide, maybe 20 feet wide. That's the minimum for a driveway. Uh, a driveway to two homes is still generally pretty small. It's a shared driveway, it's still 14, 20 feet wide. But once you get to three homes, that's a road, that's a 50 foot right of way. So we allow 20 foot right of ways for one or two houses on a driveway or a shared driveway. Once you get to three houses, it's a road. Right now, the DRB can only approve a driveway, off a house off a new 20 foot right of way. This allows me, if I so choose, to allow approve a house off a 20 foot right of way. But again, it's one or two houses only, three houses or more, it's not a 20 foot right of way, it's a minimum 50 foot right of way. So the DRB basically doesn't want to see a single house with a 20 foot right away. That, that should be something that should be approved administratively for them. And that's the change. Any questions on that one? Ron Stancliffe again. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I would like to know how you would treat a multifamily building with 20 units in it. Um, as far as the right-of-way is concerned? Generally, anything, uh, any large multifamilies is going to trigger conditional use and it go to the DRB regardless. So it's gonna to go to the DRB. Any other questions on that? All right, moving on to Section 470, signed by law. So there's a Supreme Court case a few years back about content neutrality for signs. I'm the person who enforces all the sign regulations in town for the businesses, all the lawn signs you see all over town. And yes, that was me parked in the roundabout at the top of Route 100A, picking signs out of the roundabout that aren't supposed to be there. Um, so I am the sign guy. What the, new, what the Supreme Court of the US, not Vermont, said is, if you're going to have a sign by law, you can't, you, you can be, Towns can regulate the size of signs, that's how many signs, but not what they say. If you want to have a sign that says Todd Thomas is a jerk, you can have that sign. You, we, so basically to enforce a sign regulation, you can't have to read it. So if I have to read the regulation, or read the sign to enforce a sign, that's illegal. So it's a freedom of speech thing. So there's no regulation on sign content, it's only sign size and sign count. And it took about seven years, but I finally got around to editing our sign bylaw so it's a so it complies with the Supreme Court ruling for content neutrality. So I don't have to read you don't no one has to read a sign to determine how it's regulated. The sign the sign is a sign. Which section 470. Any questions on section 470 sign bylaws? Huh? See you had me up. Come on up, I saw a question from the audience. Oh, uh, part of this as well, sorry, I focused on the sign, the, uh, the language neutrality in here for content. The dark sky, light, dark sky lighting, excuse me. Uh, the planning council worked with Limoil Stargazers to, yeah. to tweak our zoning bylaw for sign regulation yeah. to make it even better to see the stars at night. So dark sky means we shouldn't be cluttering the night sky with signs and lights that point upward. We all wanna see the stars at night. We all to point out constellations to our kids. And when we, these changes to our zoning bylaws will help reinforce that by making sure lighting is focused down in a cutoff fixture and not up in the sky where it creates light pollution. Uh, the other part of this is business signs. Uh, part of the night dark sky is business signs are supposed to be off unless they're open 24 hours off at 10 o'clock at night. So to limit light, light pollution so we can see the stars better at night. Okay. Tyler on Zoom, go ahead and then I have a question from the audience. Um, is there any changes in that, I guess, to allowing for like larger political signs and for during uh, election election season? The let me go back and look at it. Generally, I don't, that, I don't touch election that, signs; they're not worth it unless you put them in a roundabout. Then I'll get them. Because the, the only thing I'm thinking about with that would be is if there's any free speech thing by saying by limiting the size of the sign, you could in effect be limiting 
limiting speech by, you know, say, yeah, you can have whatever sign you want as long as it's eight by 10. You know what I mean? Like inches as opposed to that. Yeah. That was me. So the uh, under section 470, I'm not going to be able to distinguish a political sign from a church sign from a for sale by realtor sign because I have to read it to do that. So it's just about size and number. So yes, this does impact political signs because I can't have to read them. I mean, if I see a candidate running for Senate or House sign, I know it's a political sign, but it's just a sign. I have to regulate by the number and the size, not by what's on the sign. So it could be any kind of sign. It's all just a sign to me. So basically the person who's enforcing the signs, uh, the best thing I read is you're illiterate, you can't read. It's not its size and number, it's not what's on the sign. It doesn't matter if it's election season or not election season, the rules are the rules, sizes and numbers. It's not what's on the sign, it's not what the sign is for. You can't regulate that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, come on up. Evelyn Throne, 46 Howard. Um, I have a question about the dark sky lighting. Uh, when I moved into the house, it was just only a year, but um, I noticed that the street lights were coming like straight into my room and straight, like even back into the woods. Um, I talked to the light, the electric company, and they said that um, they would hood the light if I wanted. But my question is if, if the lights in the town are not hooded and they're going, obviously if they're not hooded, they're going upwards, how is that affected by this? And I'm, I think it's really a shame that there's, it does affect our ability to see the sky. The street lights are exempt from zoning. So it's exempt in the zoning by law. It is an improvement over recent years. There used to be metal halide lights, I believe, and those went up and everywhere and create quite a glow. And the town actually paid the village uh, Morrisville Water and Light to switch over to LEDs for all our lights probably about seven years ago now. And at least those aren't going straight up. Those go out everywhere, but they don't go up. But yes, in theory, to be more dark sky compliant, it won't be through this regulation because we don't regulate street lights in here. That's been there, it's not changed. Uh, those, all, those lights should be housed so they're directed down in a cutoff fixture. Cutoff fixture basically means if I'm looking at a light over where the camera is, that light source should be shielded by the structure of the light. I shouldn't be able to see the light bulb. That's what a cutoff fixture is. But yes, our street lights are better than they used to be, but they're still not totally dark sky compliant. I agree with you. But unfortunately, what's in there tonight won't help. But if you come to the trustee hearing next week, we do this all over again Wednesday. I'm here every week. Uh, we can discuss that with the trustees. It's not part of the zoning, obviously, but I'm sure if they hear from enough customers that they don't want street lights in their windows, and I'd be one of them. Maybe they'll make a change on that one. Thank you for the comment. Um, is there a reason why um, there's not a setback re requirement for signs? Uh, most, no, uh, most signs are out by the side of a road for like a business sign or even a political sign. If you had a front setback requirement, pretty much every sign in town would be illegal. Yeah, that would be an issue. It's usually like 25 feet from the center of the road. Correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. but we don't have a requirement. No, not for signs, no. Okay, any signs? No. Okay. Any other questions on signs? Going once, going twice. Section 482. We're modifying new conditional use for class four roads for in, to allow for infill development. So this is a new zoning bylaw from a couple of years ago where we're trying not to extend our residential homes and infrastructure into the hinterlands of the town. We're trying to be as concentric to the village as possible. So what the zoning bylaw basically says, if you're on a class four road and you're gonna build a new house, it's not something that ZR, the ZA, me, the zoning administrator, or she, whoever it should be in the future, I won't be here forever. Uh, can approve, let's go to the DRB. And the intent here was extensions of roads, go to the DRB, because every time a ambulance, we generally have one running ambulance, sometimes there's two, but there's one ambulance crew, and if they have to go all the way up to an extension of Rooney Road, if I'm here in Pleasant Street, they're 20 minutes away, 25 minutes away, depending on the weather. The intention is to not strain our infrastructure, have plows out further, ambulances out further, fire trucks out further, what this does is just modifies the condition. Right now, basically it says if you have a house on a class four road, go to the DRB. If there's a, what this basically does is allows for infill. So let's say there's a house way on a class four road, you're building a house closer, 
no big deal. The houses are, we're already serving infrastructure further out. It just clarifies, we don't want extensions of our infrastructure further out, but if you're doing an infill house on a class four road somewhere else and this house is further out on the class four road, you're okay, you can get an administrative permit. Yes, Bob, come on up. Yes, uh, Bob Borkry again, Randolph Road. So my understanding is if, let's say a developer has 200 acres out on a class four road, can that developer petition the town to take that road over? Yeah. In other words, to, yes, they could. to upgrade that road, they, they could petition the town. They to always can, yes. Yeah. So it's not part of the zoning. That's a, per the select board thing. The zoning has a, a thing in there where they go to the DRB just so we can pay special time and say, hey, this is an extension of a class four road. Before we stick houses further out in the hinterlands, is this a good idea? But the road itself is a select board consideration. The select board has the full purview over roads and how they're maintained. So generally, a zoning administrator permit or a DRB permit would say a road has to meet either private road standards, which are 16 feet wide, or the town road standards, which are a little fuzzy right now, 20 feet wide plus two foot shoulders. Um, if, they, if they chose that development of 100 acres in the class four road, chose to upgrade the road with the select board's permission to 20 foot wide with two foot shoulders, they could petition the select board to take over the road and start plowing and maintaining it, yes. So the but it's their vote. So the developer would have to do the upgrade to the road? Correct. Okay, and then petition the town to take it Correct, over. and they could say yes or no. Okay, thank you. It's up to the board at that time. I haven't had many developments in recent years where they're building to town road standards. Most developments I've seen recently, not all, but the majority are built to private road standards, which is 16 feet wide. That's a typical development with for a new road. Come on up. Hello, uh, JT Vise, uh, Ward Pond Road. Um, with the class four road, is um, that considered, can a class four road be considered privately owned? It's a town road, but it's, um, it is, no, it's not privately owned, it's a town road. It's just not to normal road standards. So on a class four road, and jump in when, I'm, when you don't want to, Eric, on a class four road, the town is only responsible for the culverts. On a class three road, for example, the town's responsible for the gravel, the grading, the plowing. Um, I think Ward Pod Road is class three for a section, and it's class four for a further section. So the town plows to the turnaround, mm -hmm. but there are a couple houses located off the end of that further down, exactly. and that's the class four section. If that is indeed, the town does the culverts and that's it. We're hands off after the culverts. Yep. But on the other part, that's improved to town standards, but it's a town road they maintain. It's still a town road further by you, but we're just responsible culvert maintenance. Okay, and then, so if there was to be more additions added to the privately owned section of, of that, of Ward Pond Road, would that need approval from the homeowners themselves or can the town kind of take over that area to allow? It's a town road, that would be a town, not a homeowner thing. But the town, for example, let's say Ward Pond Road was one time a couple of years ago, Ward Pond was gonna loop up and connect to Beacon Hill. That was part, there was a de development. The developer, Bill Card, who built the last two houses, bought them at auction, tried to buy the 35 acre uh, Carol Lawrence piece on Beacon Hill and that road was gonna loop through. At that time, he would have extended the road and that would have needed special permits because he's extending a class four road. Uh, but that obviously didn't, there are a lot of things that don't pan out, that one didn't pan out, but yes. So what this means is if you live on the class four section and let's say you subdivide your lot and your kid who's closer to Cottage Street wants to build a house, normal permit. But if you're the last house on the road and you sell a lot to your kid further out than you on the end of the road, if they want to build a house, they need to go to the development review board and the town's gonna to decide, do we really want a house this far out? So, and Ward Pond's probably not the best example because I can, I can walk there in 10 minutes, but we're always more talking about like Mud City area or Sterling Valley area, those kind of areas. So um, with the 35 acres on that, can that road be, be led into that 35 acres without uh, homeowner permission? Let's say a development goes into that 35 acres. Can that road be? It's a town road, so it'd be select board permission to be up to these guys. And um, even though it's privately owned currently right now? If it's a class four road, it wouldn't be privately owned as a town road. Okay. Like so so that, I guess th that question that you just said, that, that the original idea was to loop that into Beacon Hill, that could still happen? That could still happen, yes. I think, that, I think that idea has come and gone because they built houses there where the connection would have been. Okay. And I don't think that's planned. I actually have that. Um, the development of that 35 acres is a, uh, I have it on the next DRB. So it didn't make the November DRB agenda, but it's uh, it's gonna be on the December DRB or January DRB agenda whenever right. the next meeting. So there are, the only thing that's proposed right now are nine houses on two roads out there on that 35 acres. 
Uh, that's not the end of the, I, mean, I think that's only the first foray of the development, but nothing is connecting through the Ward Pond Road. It's not closed. So everything on that development right now is a short little, there's two short little roads, one a little longer than the other. It's nine houses. Okay. So, so not, nothing even close to Ward Pond. And I don't okay. think that idea is even really feasible at this point. Okay. Yeah. So, so but it, it, it could theoretically happen without homeowners permission. Yes, the, I think the okay. best way to do that, if you don't want your road to be a class road, you want to be a private road, you ask the town to throw up the road and the town may choose to do that. They may not choose to do that. Sometimes they downgrade it to a trail. They can discontinue the road altogether. Then it would revert back to the homeowners and it would be your decision to block someone or not block someone who's trying to lengthen your road. Okay. Uh, but that's a different kettle of fish in the zoning change. Yeah, because yeah, right now we, we pay for the maintenance of the road, of that section yep. of the road that we live on. Yep. We were just concerned about the extension of that into that property past our house. It's, it's still possible. Okay. So right now, well, all this the zoning change does is, if you're gonna be the last house, a new house and road is proposed further out than the ones now, that needs a special permit in front of the DRB okay. to make sure we really wanna be going out that far. But none of this relates to that road looping to Beacon Hill. Uh, those guys are in the room tonight. If you want to talk to them, you can find them at the end of the meeting. The and uh, would, 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 we, would the homeowners be notified? Uh, yes, it'd be a DRB hearing. So. Okay. Um, there, again, there's no proposal. I brought this up example. Maybe it's a bad example, obviously. Uh, but I think you were getting the same yeah. thing anyway. Yeah. We're speaking the same just, language yeah. here. Uh, there's no proposal to loop that road to Ward Pond whatsoever. The okay. proposal, you can come look at it in my office tomorrow. It's a short little, it's two little short little dead end cul-de-sac roads that are probably no more top of my head, 500 feet from, from uh, Cottage Street, maybe 700 feet at most. It doesn't come close to the end of Ward Pond. Ward okay. Pond from, Ward Pond from Beacon Hill is probably a good, 2,500 feet maybe. And those that road proposed for the nine houses off Cottage, off of Beacon Hill right there, uh, are probably no more than 500, 700 feet from Beacon Hill. So there's another 2,000 feet to go. That's a whole different, okay. whole different moving mountains to get there. Okay. So I mean, not part of the zoning change again, but I wouldn't worry about that anytime soon. Okay, thank but you. Those thank guys you are time. here. Feel free to grab them after the meeting. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on, what, what am I on again? My God. 482, thank you. Any other questions on 482? I thought that was gonna be an easy one. Uh, section 484, uh, edit gas station rules to clarify front setback. So basically, uh, it was unclear what the front setback were for gas stations. Uh, we don't allow new gas stations in town, haven't for many years now. Uh, this is basically only gonna be used for the redevelopment of existing gas stations. And all our existing gas stations got redeveloped within the last couple of years, except maybe the Sitco out in 15. So. This probably uh, won't be used anytime soon, but it just clarifies that front setback requirement. Uh, why don't you allow gas stations? Do you want Lee to come up? Lee LeBeer asked why we don't allow gas stations. Uh, the planning council decided to take that out a bunch of years ago. Uh, we don't allow new gas stations. Um, the McMahon's property sitting vacant is one of the reasons we don't allow gas stations. That's there, so it's, that's being rented by a gas station company to keep it vacant. Gas stations aren't great uses. You don't want a lot of them in town. For example, if you look at the, uh, and gas stations in theory are, are a dying breed over the years as more, car, more of a cars become electric. And you'll see more gas stations in car repair places go out because of the electrification of cars. So if you look at the old Sunoco downtown, uh, that is a challenging property. Gas stations have spills, they have cleanups, there's environmental damage that's done, environmental cleanup work that's needed to, do, needed to be done. And gas station owner like the Sunoco, which is owned by Global Montello out of Woburn, Mass. Woburn? Waltham. Waltham, Mass. Yeah, thank you. You started with a W. Uh, so Global Montello puts a deed restriction. If, when they close a gas station because it's no longer economically viable, they put all sorts of restrictions on it. No housing, no retail, no commercial. There's all sorts of restrictions on gas stations. Gas stations become dead properties. You don't want them. You don't want more gas stations in town. And honestly, no one's going to really propose them anyway. Any other questions on gas station rules? Uh, section 485, uh, this is probably the, easy, the smallest change in the whole thing. Um, editing language that talks about zoning districts and using zones instead of districts. Doesn't get more simple than that. Uh, section 488, we're revising, go ahead, sorry. Just the language change, we're talking about zones instead of districts. It's, it's, it's a kind of archaic language. People talk about what zone are you in, they're talking about what district are you in. Just a language change. Modernization. Uh, section 48, revised rules for RV camper parking. Right now, you cannot park your RV in your driveway. This will change that. 
So uh, section 488 allows RVs to be parked in driveways. Right now, RVs must be parked in, in the backyard or side yard, no closer the, to the road than the, uh, the front facade line of the house. If you take the front side line of the house, go from side to side to the property line, RVs have to be back behind that. This allows someone to park an RV in their driveway. It also clarifies other RV related rules for parking uh, and, primitive, and allows them to be used during construction as a primitive camp. So the Vermont wastewater rules uh, speak to a primitive camp. It can't be used more than 20 days in a row, more than 60 days in a year. And uh, so basically we're allowing RVs to be lived in during the construction of a single family home. So let's say you buy some land. Uh, I see it often with young couples. They'll live in an RV uh, camper as they build their home. And as long as the camper is hooked up to septic, we're allowing that provided it's during the construction of a, of a house. So this um, really codifies a practice that happens now and we're making it, uh, we're making it legal to do so. Yes, come on, come on up Al. Or yell it, I'll repeat it. Come on, okay. At a previous meeting, we talked about parking your campers in a driveway. And I understood you to tell me that you changed that after that last meeting. This, this is the change. This change has been on the books. So this zoning change to back up a little bit here. This is two and a half years of planning council work. So we probably discussed RVs right before the pandemic or maybe right as the pandemic started. It was a long time ago. Tom shaking his head. At, at, a, his head. at the meeting we had up at Copley, we talked about camper parking in a driveway. Same exact language. Nothing's changed. And you, I understood you, te you to tell me that you would change that so it was legal for us to park our campers in our driveway. Yes, that's what we're doing tonight. So right now, because this language is worn, that's the exact so same that, language. That it, didn't happen until now. Yeah, nothing, can, nothing happens. Planning has no approval power. Everything up at Copley under the tent, the whole people with a meeting with 140 people there, it's advisory only. These guys punch the ticket. There's a conductor on the train. Planning's not. Okay, but that that change will be put into effect as a result of, the, result of this change? If these nice people and the trustees vote to approve it, yes, be, it will. So we, we will be clear that we can park our campers in our driveway. Right now, because this is warned, I'm not gonna give you a hard time about parking a camper in a driveway. But once this is approved, yes, you can legally park a camper in a driveway. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on from camper parking and camper rules. Oh, I've got a question. And Todd, this came up at, um, I think, a Board of Embankment meeting <coughs> last week. But what about tiny houses? How do they, how do they fit into all of this? Uh, we do have a tiny house bonus in town. I think it's section 423C. Uh, tiny houses have to be uh, on blocks off their wheels and skirted or on a permanent foundation. That way they're taxable. So you, if you have a tiny house that's on wheels somewhere, it's not legal. It needs a permit. The permit requires it to be skirted up on blocks. So it's off their wheels, which means they're a taxable dwelling, just like your house. The intent of that is to allow tiny houses, but if we allow tiny houses without the requirement that they're blocked and skirted, they're enjoying all the benefits of town, the, the schools, the uh, plowing of roads, the police and fire without paying the taxes. So that's why not some, not all people, but some people do tiny houses, they escape that property tax. You, we, we actually encourage tiny houses in Morrisville, but they have to be blocked and skirted. So they're permanent dwellings. So any tiny house should be taxable. No free rides, even for tiny houses. Is it 423? Is it 423? I'm off the top of my head. Bonus 424. That's a tiny house bonus 424. I was one off. I was close. So we're the only municipality in Vermont with a tiny house bonus. So we, the planning council has looked to encourage them. But if we get a, we've had a few. We haven't had a, this hasn't been a rush by any means. We've got maybe a dozen or so tiny houses. But the, the tiny houses we've enticed to come here are going to share in the tax burden with us. They pay for the cost of government, plowing, uh, police, fire, uh, geeky planning guys who do permits like me. Everyone shares the cost. There's no free rides for the tiny houses. Yes, go ahead, Tyler. Um, do they count as 
like if you're already on a, for if you already have a residential property, we may be getting into this earlier anyways. Like if you had a uh, residential property and you wanted to put um, a tiny house on it, would that have to count as an EDU or is there a special carve out? Like if it's a tiny house or something like that, like you could have more than one. Well, it's a great question. The actual a tiny house is a house for all intents and purposes. If you have a parcel of land and you want to park a big house on or a small house on it. We don't really care. As long as it's on a foundation or up on, on blocks and skirted, we count you as a house. Uh, our bonus is everyone in property gets a, everyone, let's say you're out in the town somewhere, you have a lot, you get a house. If it's owner-occupied, ADUs or accessory dwelling units, our requirement is, is most towns are owner-occupied. So you can have an, an accessory dwelling unit. Most common in town, people like myself have an apartment above the garage they rent out. Uh, so that's the ADU. In Morrisville only, we allow Morrisville, Morristown, I say every, Morrisville for everything. Uh, we allow a third dwelling unit. If it's on, if the property's owner-occupied, you could have a tiny house. So everyone in this room, you've got a lot in town somewhere, you can have your house, you can have an accessory dwelling unit, which is state statute, the towns have to allow it. Uh, it can be an apartment in your house, it can be a separate dwelling, apartment above the garage. We also allow that third tiny house, but that's only only, only owner-occupied properties. You're not owner-occupied in one dwelling unit. When you're owner-occupied, you get your property, uh, accessory apartment, an ADU, and then you get also get that third unit, which is the tiny house bonus. And a tiny house is anything with a footprint of 500 square feet or less in terms of footprint of the structure. It doesn't count decks or patios. All right. Hi. Hi. Um, Mariah, again. I have a question if you could define what owner-occupied means. Owner-occupied is a term in the back of our zoning bylaw. It basically says... Uh, your primary Vermont residence, not your primary residence. It's your basically it's where you live in town. Um, it's your it's your, if it's your one house in town that's your under our zoning. It's your it's owner occupied. So let's say originally so the it room, doesn't have to be occupied. It just had to, to be owned. No, no, not quite. So it was we originally wrote this so it's owner occupied. But then the people who are in Florida for six days in a month for tax reasons said, hey, you're leaving us out of the equation here. So basically, it's your Vermont property. It's your one place in town. If you own a house in town. And if you own a, own a property in town, you live there, you get the ability of, to an ADU and uh, a tiny house, even if you're in Florida for six months in a day. Okay. So we're just not cutting out the snowbirds. So, so, But what's the occupancy part of it? Why would you have occupancy involved in that definition if there's no occupancy requirement? Yeah, in theory, you could have, if you have two houses, I could spend 351 days in Florida and the other handful of days here, that is still my... Vermont, Morrisville owner occupied property, even though it's short term rented the rest of the time or long term rented. But yes, that's true. It's lenient, but that's the definition. Okay. Not part of this meeting, but I would suggest uh, clarifying that and removing the occupancy aspect of it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions on this part? Well, this part was 424 or 488. 488. We're kind of off base here, but that's okay. David Ring, I'd like to also have you clarify an owner, considering this, as I, was, that I do a lot of research and I see a lot of trusts. Now, if it's owner-occupied, what about a trust? A trust has existence, but is it an owner? And it's just, if you say these are owner-occupied, how can a trust, as you're saying, Occupy something. Well, in, under Section 48, we're talking about RV rules for campers and parking. If the trust was the owner of the property, and that's their only, if the trust is that's their only place in Morrisville, the the trust gets the accessory dwelling unit okay, in the townhouse. You. At least that's the way I would interpret it. Section 490. Moving on. We beat campers and RVs to death now. Uh, Section 490. It's a uh, kind of companion to what we spoke about earlier. We're revising lighting rules to better comply with dark sky initiatives. We talked about that earlier. We're trying to better see the stars at night and make sure our, our lights and signs don't add to or contribute to light pollution that makes the, light, the night sky harder to see. That one should be pretty straightforward. Uh, section 500, doing some revisions to site plan requirements for new compost rules. Compost required, so compost, dumpster, recycling. And we're doing requiring cluster mailboxes for multifamily properties. And that's a request of the postmaster. So the postmaster wants cluster mailboxes. You're driving a property, you see that little 
box thing on a post and it's got all the little box with keys, the little things there. That's a cluster mailbox. That's what the postmaster wants for multifamily properties. And it's going in, unless someone objects here, it's going in the zoning code or the trustees object. Any questions on cluster mailboxes or site plan rules? Section 503, uh, make very minor change to conditional approval language. It's just a really small language change. I can read it if need be, but it's, it's about as simple as can be. Uh, section 510, various changes, to, and there's gonna be questions on this. Section 510 is various changes to conservation subdivision bylaw. Delete the density bonus and require lotting. So I'm gonna do the lotting first because the lotting is not gonna require questions, I don't think, but the density bonus is. So uh, right now it's become a little complicated with how we do, uh, how we assign parcels when there's just a open space easement and not a lot. So this strengthens our conservation subdivision bylaw. So if someone is going to do a conservation lot, it requires a town parcel ID. It's a lot, it has meets and bounds, it's got a deed. Uh, that makes it much easier for everyone involved. Uh, the developer may disagree, but I think it's better for the town on the whole. And again, a conservation subdivision, big picture, so I don't speak in too much uh, jargon here, is let's say you own 100 acres in the town. Uh, if you're in a conventional subdivision, you can do 52 acre lots. And a conservation subdivision, you can still do the same uh, 50 lots, but it's 51 acre lots, and it's 50 acres of dedicated open space, which is available for recreation for the community. So same number of houses, uh, but the lot sizes are, are smaller, the road impact is smaller, the road sizes, the storm water is less, there's, there's less water lines, less sewer lines, because you're developing a smaller area, less engineering too. Uh, the, big, the other part of this, which I'll get some questions on, is uh, the Conservation Commission proposed to remove the density bonus. So right now, if you're doing a conservation subdivision and you're conserving 75% of the land instead of 50%, you get a density bonus. If you are on a paved road, you get a density bonus, or if you're in the village, you get a density bonus. Uh, that's basically saying it's kind of steering development where we want it. We want it on paved roads. We don't want it off uh, gravel roads. We want development in the village where possible. And uh, what's the third one? Village, paved roads, what did I say? Third one, village paved roads, 75%, 75 thank you. And uh, if they want to conserve more, it's a carrot to a lot of the developer. They want to conserve 75% of the parcel as open space. And if you want to lump everything into the 25%, we'll allow more density as a carrot for you to entice the developer to do that. Uh, this proposed language uh, change strikes that entire density bonus. So the whole thing would be gone. So uh, no more 75% carrot. No more paved road or village density bonus language. Any questions on that? Yes. Go ahead, Ron. Ron Stankloff. <clears throat> uh, I guess the, <clears throat> what I find difficult with this particular um, omission, there's an omission. Uh, out of your office, we borrowed a book that you brought up from Down Country on, on development and uh, conservation. And it was an interesting book. But in reading that, and the way the computations were made, you left out a very important sentence. <clears throat> that the lot calculation, and I'm speaking about paragraph 4B and 510, is after deducting out the undevelopable land listed in site-specific purposes. <clears throat> now, you've already mentioned in your example of a 100-acre lot, and of course, 50 houses on 50 acres means that we're no longer in our two-acre minimum that we've had for years in the town. <coughs> Now, if our acreage was five acre minimum out in the town, I could see where you could have smaller lots, but not going below the two acre minimum. The reason being that two acres is needed for water and waste disposal. Unless the developer can find one big area where he can have the waste and then whatever is the water source uh, is allowed by the state. 
So <clears throat> I, I would like to have that sentence after deducting out the undeveloped land listed in site-specific purposes because it was in the book that you let us read uh, <laughs> to come up with what you have today. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. It's a good book. I agree with you. Hi, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Brian Hamer, 165 Beacon Hill Road. Um, and I agree with what Ron, Ron is saying, and I understand how the, the conservation subdivision and preserving the two acres of land in the town of Morrisville is important, um, especially for these folks. Um, but I would encourage you to oppose the deletion of the conservation subdivision density bonus as it applies to the village. Um, if we're really trying to drive housing and encourage housing to be built in the village, um, I think that this density bonus really goes a long way to helping people do so who have on-site sewer and water. Um, and I've written a letter to each of you and to the village trustees as well, just kind of expressing our concerns and our point of view. And I uh, just want to take this moment. Thank you. Thank you. And it does sound like the, uh, it's premature to say definitively, the trustees, from what I've heard so far, um, may agree with this line of thinking, so the select board would need to match that from the trustees. Uh, so if the, if the trustees decide we don't want to delete this in the village, the town select board will have to match that to have a matching zoning bylaw. So I, I do think that uh, proposal probably has legs. We'll see how it all sugars off, though. The proposal of Brian's proposal? Brian's proposal, yes. It sounds like the trustees are unlikely to delete it in the village. So that density bonus is going to remain at least in the village and the select board will have to match it in some way. Will we be, um, will we be seeing the, um, the current um, zoning and the proposed side by side, or is that up to us to, to look at that? I just learned tonight, I think you're gonna have a joint meeting with the trustees to work out any language interpretation issues, kind of like a conference committee, you like the Senate and the House working on proposed language before the governor signs it. Uh, I think you're gonna have a joint meeting with the trustees where you have to agree. What we're trying to avoid is, I think with the town plan approval hearing, I must have ping pong back and forth a dozen times and change the town plan, change the town plan, the select board changes this, the trustees change that. We have to have the exact same wording, so uh, I'm hoping to lock you all in a room and not let you out until you come up with the agreeing the language with the trustees. No, I'm joking, but um, hopefully uh, that joint meeting can help foster that process approval quicker so it doesn't take us seven months and a lot of taxpayer expense of multiple hearings and going back and forth to make small tweak, small tweak and come to consensus quicker. Does that help? Okay. Come on up, Bob. Oh. Our development our development has a state issued subdivision permit. And, and my understanding that many major projects, even in the town or village, require that. Can you overrule a state subdivision permit with your subdivision language that you're, you're talking about here? No, a developer has two masters. They have to go through the town permit requirements and then the state permit requirements, and sometimes a third master, which is Act 250 permit requirements. So. There are a lot of different mouths to feed in the permit process line, and the developer would have to have all those permits match. So uh, the town doesn't have the ability to overrule anything from the state because if the town says something, the state wants to say no, it's over. They can't do the project. Have, the state doesn't. They would approve. have to have a town village subdivision permit as well as a state subdivision. Correct. Permit? Yes. It's a lot of hoops to jump through to develop property in Vermont. That's why. That's why it's hard to do it. Not many people do it. Tom, come on up next, and Bob, go ahead. Yes, uh, Bob Bortry again. Todd, I just want to clarify something that the gentleman before this gentleman spoke about, and that was his comment was that this bonus subdivision was driving um, development in the village or town, in the village itself. I fail to see how that works in the more rural community. In other words, so, so my understanding is that this board 
and the village trustees have to agree on the same language. Correct. It's a Morrisville Morristown zoning bylaw. It's a joint bylaw, but both both are both legislative bodies have to approve the exact same thing to have a joint bylaw. Otherwise, we have a town plan for the village, a town plan for the town, zoning for the town, zoning for the village, and you have double the amount of government here. Right, I understand that. But I guess what I'm getting at is this sounds to me as if we are expanding this heavy density into our more rural areas. In other words, not confining it to just the downtown historic district, but someone could have a hundred acres and put God knows how many places on, in it. The existing I, density bonus, yes. There's proposals to strike the density bonus, so that would take it away from the town. Right now in the town, it's only a 75% uh, conserved. So if they're conserving 75%, developing 25%, so they can do more dense housing in that 25% or a paved road. So for example, Geltz Road, this has no impact on. But right now on Stancliff Road, people could do more dense housing because it's a paved road. Or somewhere on Laporte Road, it's that's, a paved road. So that's, the proposal to strike the language keeps more dense development. Uh, well, it just deletes it everywhere. It doesn't, if the proposal is to keep in the village and out of the town, that concentrates in the village. Left as unchanged, left as, um, if it was left unchanged, it's supposed to be deleted. You could get dense development on some paved roads in the town. That's true. Okay. So... It sounds like there's going to be a bit of an impasse here between the two boards is, is kind of what it sounds like. Perhaps. So we have the select board. The select board could, so the proposal from the planning council is delete the density bonus. The planning council agree with the conservation commission. The density bonus is being struck, is being struck. So it's gone. The trustees are saying, wait a minute, we want housing, single family homes, especially in the village. Uh, we're okay with it. We don't want to strike it. It'll be up to the select board to either say, we don't want to strike in the town either, or leave it struck in the town, we'll have to say it's a law only in the village. And personally, not to get in my soapbox here, I'm one of the 12 people in the room who know where the village and town lines lie are. So I hate having different rules for the town and the village because I know where the village and town lines are, but most people don't. So that means everyone out there, we have a rule that's so arcane, no one knows where it starts and ends because almost no one in this town knows where the village starts and the town stops. So I don't like doing that. I'm hoping the select board and trustees work out something so it's one policy for the entire town because uh, it gets messy when we do village rules and town rules. It's messy. Well, I can understand that. Yep. I, I, I guess my, my greatest concern is I'm not, and I don't think many people in this room are, anti-development. Uh, what I would hate to see happen is this dense development creeping into our rural nature of the surrounding town that we live in. This is my greatest fear, and I feel it's fear of a lot of people who live here, who have made their livelihood here, and who cherish what we have. And I do not want to see that disappear. So Mr. Bortry is saying he'd like you to delete the conservation density bonus for the town. Thank you. Stick, stick with us proposed, yes. However, so you have the different rules where the village, you'll have to work it out with the village where it stays in the village and it's gone in the town. Mr. Snip, Planning Council Member Snip. Tom Snip, Morris uh, Town Council Member, Village Trustee. I think we have to be careful about speaking for other councils Understood, because yes. this is why we're all here is yep. to kind of go through things and maybe come with changes. So we don't want to put anything in the thoughts into other people's heads what's going to happen. That's why we're here. That's why we're discussing this. And let's just keep it that way, okay, without assuming anything else. Sure. That's all. Thank Doing a good job. I did say a little uh, premature, but yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for saying that, Tom. I appreciate Any other questions on deleting the debt? Yes, a bunch one. of questions. Uh, well, Lee, this, come is, on up. this is just a clarification question. So initially, I feel like what I was hearing you say, Todd, and feel free to interrupt and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the two boards must align. They must align, yes. Okay, but then you just said, after he spoke and we applauded, that uh, if the town would like to, you know, strike this and kind of protect our rural areas without including the high density, blah, 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 that they could do that and be misaligned with the trustees. Is that a viable option or is it, are they legally bound to align? The bylaw must be the same for the town and village, but the bylaw could say, and I hate doing it, but it's these rules for the town and these rules for the village. So basically the density bonus be rewritten to eliminate 
the 75% piece, eliminate the paved road in the town, and just remain the density bonus is only for properties in the village. So it would be one of those rules where only the village gets the bonus, the town does it, no one knows the village line is, but that might be the best way to move forward here. If the trustees, again, big if, thank you, Tom, actually decide they want to keep the density bonus in the village. Okay, uh, follow-up question and then so I'll walk away. So it's just going to be one zoning bylaw at the end. No matter what the zoning bylaw says. It can say anything. As long they as just both have boards to agree. agree on what it says. 1,000%. Okay, so that is great. And I think that will give a lot of people a nice deep sigh of relief. So what I'm hearing is the select board on any of these items and any items going forward for town zoning does not have to shake hands and kumbaya with what the village trustees say and all be one happy family they can just agree with the verbiage like they can have their own mind and go we think that that this is best the village trustees can say well this is best and this is what we want to satisfy and they can write in verbiage where both needs are met in one document it yes. doesn't have to be one ideology correct. that's met you just obviously yes that's correct to some extent you keep separating right. the town the village and no one knows the village boundaries are at some point, is it makes sense to have village rules and town rules in a separate document, but we're nowhere near that. So yes, the select board and trustees, if they do end up disagreeing on the lead and the density bonus, can, as long as it's the same wording in one document, we're good, and the village gets treated differently than the town. Okay, but and that can be on that. any line of ideology. Yes. Ideology does not need to just be single-minded. Just hopefully not all of it, yes. Okay, but anything. Yes. Ideology does not need to be single-minded. just has to be single verbiage. Thank you, Mariah. Okay. Lee, you had a comment? Come on up. I want to the mic. They can't hear you on Zoom unless Zoom's important. They can't hear you in the Zoom unless you're on the mic. I just wanted to ask Todd on this density. Just say you have a hundred acres, but uh, and you can put fifty houses on yep. it. Uh, but thirty of that hundred acres are unusable. Do you still have the same density? You still have the same density. This is get Ron's point earlier. The To do the conservation subdivision the way it's done in actually the book, Randall Arndt's book, uh, conservation subdivision book, you back out the wetlands, you back out uh, steep slopes, you back out unbuildable areas. Uh, the cost of that up front is, can be quite staggering. So let's say you have 100 acres and you've got deep ravines, you've got wetlands, you've got protected habitat, you've got to pay someone to go do wetland lines, figure all this stuff out and says, okay, I'm 100 acres, I got 60 left, and then I do the density. So when the calculations are made to put in the conservation subdivision bylaw, we didn't want to load all those upfront costs on the landowner and basically kept it to a simple math equation. You get 50 acres, I mean, you get 100 acres, you get roughly 50 houses. Um, so we didn't subtract the wetlands or anything like that because it's too costly for the average homeowner to do. And we don't do that elsewhere in town. We don't say, I've got two acre. I've got a two acre lot. I want to build a house. So I said, well, is it really two acres? Is it one and a half acres and half acres of wetland? And I'm going to deny your permit because of it. We don't do that for house site. We don't do that for larger development sites. There's a lot of cost to it. That's the main reason. But the state does it. But yeah, they'd have to get permits done through the state. But the density is really done by the town. The state will make sure. And the bylaw itself steers towns away from the steep slopes. Steers towns away. Steers houses away from the wetlands. Steers the development away from these areas. It protects them anyway. Uh, it just doesn't subtract the area. It just I mean you own the land. We're not, that bylaw already takes half of the homeowner's land and puts it for public use. We're not looking to take more by subtracting out things we don't think you can build on. You have 100 acres and 70 of it, 70 it's upland and 30% is wetland. You still get a hundred, you still own 100 acres, you pay tax on 100 acres. We give you zoning for 100 acres. We're not gonna take 30 off at the top because you've got some wet areas. Okay. That makes sense? Etienne? Etienne Hancock. Uh... Planning Council Chair, uh, just on this density bonus, uh, I wanted to clarify that the intention of the density bonus, whenever it was five or seven years ago, it was well intentioned to try to concentrate um, housing in appropriate locations. Uh, paved, paved roads, the village, exactly. Paved roads, the village. We, we um, I realize there are some specific projects or a project that has come up that's really outside of the purview of planning. We, we can't really look at individual projects. We, we really can't even care one way about them at all. The preferred solution here would be to say this well-intentioned bylaw that we want to strike right now um, should be revised next year for the next go around uh, to try to clarify what was, we have, we have problems clarifying, <coughs> excuse me, the calculation of housing concentration 
with the way the bylaw was written. It was confusing for us when we revisited it. And honestly, because it had not been used yet, we felt let's just strike it, uh, avoid the argument, and we'll try again later. That would be the proposal that I would leave you with, the same one I'll leave to the village trustees. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, Tim, um, just a clarifying question. Um, so you're saying that if we voted to strike this and to go with the proposed um, wording, that would be um, thinking ahead that this would be rewritten? We would have that option to rewrite it and we would of course take the input from this board uh, and from the village trustees because there are specific projects and once there are specific projects that might utilize the density bonus, it gives us the opportunity to rethink it uh, in a planful way and have it apply to the entire town. Having one more year to do it, that's, that's an easy choice for the planning role. I realize it's not an easy choice for developers. Any other questions on the conservation subdivision density bonus? Again, it's being proposed to be struck both in the town and village. Yes, come up to the mic, please. It's David Ring. Could you please give us uh, a brief explanation of how the density bonus applies in the village or what criteria is related to the density bonus in the village? We've talked a lot about the town, but not much in the village. Well, as of right now, um, with this zoning being worn, there is no conservation subdivision density bonus. It's gone as of right now. Unless this, if the select board or trustees decide to leave that proposed deletion on the cutting room floor and leave it in the zoning bylaw, then it's back. So it's currently this, the bonus is gone. This is warned. The new zoning is in effect until it gets voted down. So we have no conservation subdivision bonus. But as it was before the zoning was warned, uh, there's no criteria any to where parts of the village get the bonus. The bonus is anywhere in the village. So if you're subdividing land, and granted, there's not a lot of subdivide, large subdivisions especially, but there's not a lot of subdividable land left in the village. So it's not, there are a few, tra a few larger tracks, but not a lot, uh, but it's allowed anywhere in the village. So it's just, just not paved, it's something else along with it, paved? In the village. So the density bonus, as it was written, you get a density bonus if you're in the village on its own, that lives or dies by itself. You get a density bonus regardless of village or town or if you're on a paved road. So the intent here is there's gonna be development in the town, let's concentrate it on Laporte Road, state maintains it, not us. Uh, the paved roads in town. There aren't a ton in the town, but the paved roads, we want to see more houses there. We don't want to see more houses in Sterling Brook or Mud City or those areas or uh, Upper Mama Mountain Road where it's not paved. So we're trying to concentrate development to the paved areas uh, for sake of uh, uh, ease of ma road maintenance, uh, utilities, everything else that goes with it. And the other part was if you can serve 75% of the area, regardless of where you are, you get the density bonus. So in the village, regardless of roads, in the town, only on paved roads, or in the town, if you can serve 75%. But again, that bonus is gone right now unless the select board or trustees choose to restore it. Any other questions on this? All right, I think we beat that one to death. Let's move on. So I'm on section 610. Uh, minor language change we're talking about. We're just noting that the development review board is jointly appointed. We're Super minor revision to state the obvious. It's not in there right now. Um, 612, uh, match statute for public warning periods. So right now we require a 15 day warning, a uh, newspaper posting at the town offices and library. We posted uh, on the town website 15 days before a conditional use hearing is required by state law. Site plans only required seven days prior. And so we're matching that state rules. Right now we're requiring everything for 15, which is incorrect. We're trying to match the state statute. So it's 15 for conditional use, seven for site plan review. So we're just trying to tie up our zoning so it matches state statute there. What is the priority? Uh, we do 15 everything. So we don't match state statute. State statute's 15 conditional use, seven site plan review, and we're trying to match state statute. So section 610. I'm sorry, six, no, 620, sorry. Uh, we're correcting the zoning bylaw site for severability. Severability generally means if 
one part of a zoning bylaw is found to be illegal, it states that the rest remain in effect. And we just have an incorrect site in there. It's referring to the wrong number. So we're just fixing the number. Doesn't get much more simple than that. Uh, section 710, uh, minor subdivision definition change. So right now, if you're doing a minor subdivision, let's say you own 10 acres. If you want to create two new lots and give one to your two kids, your son gets a lot, your daughter gets a lot, I can approve both lots. They have road frontage. Let's say you live on Churchill Road. You get two lots, uh, 10 acres, want to create a lot for both kids, I can approve both lots. Uh, in the future, I can only approve one lot, so you're going to approve one lot at a time. So you're going to approve one lot for one kid, and you have to come back later and do a separate application for the other lot, or, or you have to go to the DRB if you're creating more than one lot at a time, because you're going to do two lots at a time, you're in the conservation subdivision process, you're deeding half your land away to the town. That's the way it works. So right now, two lots and less is handled as a conventional subdivision administratively. Three lots and more is a conservation subdivision where you can serve half the land and gives half to the town. Uh, we're lowering that threshold, making it any more than one new lot at a time. So if you wanna create a new lot, conventional subdivision, great. But if you're creating two lots, it's now a conservation subdivision, goes through that process that we just talked about. Any questions on this? Tyler, didn't think you were gonna speak tonight for a while. Uh, Tyler, Tyler Mumley, 46 Hutchins. Uh, so we talked earlier about uh, conservation subdivisions. So all major subdivisions have to be conservation subdivisions, which means 50% of the, the land has to be conserved and given to the town, um, which is uh, a nice thing to have done and, and really applicable for larger tracts of land. But uh, when it comes to smaller developments, family subdivisions and such, it, it can be a huge impact uh, giving up that much land. So currently, if you're doing three or three or more new lots, you're a major subdivision, you're a conservation subdivision, you're giving up your land. This new rule would mean if you're doing two or more lots, you're now triggered into that major subdivision status. Correct. Um, so not only, currently Todd can approve a two lot subdivision and it's not conservation and that's gonna change. So more people have to go to the DRB to get approval and more people are gonna to have to give up 50% of their property. And these are talking about pretty smaller smaller developments and we see a lot of those come through a lot of family subdivisions that are happening so it's just a pretty um, intense application to, to put on somebody with smaller amount of land small amount of lots to go through that process and i think it will be uh have an impact on those smaller subdivision projects and i would suggest that you know we uh strike that from those proposed changes and try to revisit that you know, like we just talked about for the density bonus, revisit this in a way that really gets at the basis of why it's, it's getting changed because I think it will have a negative impact on just simple, rural, uh, small subdivisions. Um, Todd, could you or Etienne speak to the um, reasoning behind that? Uh, sure. Uh, this decision to reduce the definition for a major subdivision from two new lots at a time to one new lot at a time was really tied to the conservation subdivision piece. It all came as one. So uh, conservation subdivision came to be uh, as part of myself and the planning council proposing it to get out from under from Act 250 per, uh, permit restrictions on our sewer plant. So the sewer plant, anytime you add a new line to it, you have to update the Act 250 permit for the entire sewer plant. As the town just saw with the gravel pit permit process, which you're probably not even through at this point, or you're through, but maybe you're not through, that's a different story. It's a her Herculean effort to go through an act, update an Act 250 permit for a large project, as we all saw. The zoning, uh, the sort plant permit, had a condition that should have been appealed, and it wasn't, that any time we add a new sewer line to the plant, we have to update that sewer plant's entire Act 250 permit. Super onerous. So until we had enhanced zoning that protected prime ag, uh, in, largely in the village, and just in the the close by sections of the town. So what the planning council did is we changed our downtown zoning to allow a lot more development downtown, which we've done, which you're seeing. We're directing development downtown that was required by Act 250. And also what Act 250 wanted to see is protection of prime egg soils elsewhere. And that's why we did the conservation subdivision process. One of those, uh, one of the criteria in the conservation subdivision is that that prime ag soils are part of the conserved land. So you're not developing the prime ag soils. So we did this to get out from under the restriction, which we successfully did that Every time we had a sewer line, we had to update the sewer plant permit. Super onerous, super expensive. No one wanted to do it. So 
Uh, I think we're all very happy. This happened probably 2013. No, 2015. I think I worked in it literally five years with Act 250 to get out from under that permit. We're finally out from under it. And the fear was there were some developers who were doing uh, conventional subdivision two lots at a time this month, two lots next month, two lots next month. So they're doing a eight lot subdivision over the course of four months. And it really should be a conservation subdivision because that's the intent of the language. And they're, the two lots at a time is totally legal, but it's kind of like a really iterative backdoor way of getting a conventional subdivision because no one wants to give up half their land. Generally, they don't, but the state's forcing it, forcing us to do it the conservation subdivision way. So we were concerned that if we didn't uh, kind of close that loophole and tighten it a little bit, and it's going to create a lot more work for me in my office because uh, I'm doing instead of doing two lots at a time, one lot at a time, one lot at a time, that loophole is still open. It's just going to be much more laborious now than it even is now. But that loophole is being used. The intent <coughs> is to tighten the loophole to make it more of a uh, threading a needle than it is to do two lots at a time. That's the thought process behind it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. And we haven't heard of Act 250 coming after us yet for two lot subdivisions, but it's not a conversation I want to have if I can avoid it. Mr. Wilson, come on up. Ed Wilson, Fraser Road. Todd, if I understand this correct, well, first lot, I'll give you the situation. We have an 80 acre lot. If we want to give a lot to our daughter, a lot to our son to build a house, and then farther down the road, they want to uh, give some of that land to their children, are you telling me that we have to give the town a portion of that land so that they can have those lots? Yes. That's confiscation. That is the uh, Act 250 requirement of the state store permit. That's con it's still con confiscation. You're taking our land. Do we get reimbursed for taxes? Uh, you do not, no. That's no longer our land? Okay. We can't, we couldn't plant stuff on it. We couldn't uh, do the... Uh, SB deeded to the town or a conservation uh, organization like the Still Land Trust or someone like that. Mm -hmm. That's existing rule. I totally get it. It's pretty, that's a Tyler's point. It's pretty onerous when you say, here's my land, the 20 acres I paid taxes on all these years, and to give away three lots at a time to my kids, I'm going to lose, if I'm doing two acres, six acres of kids, I'd give six acres, or six acres to the town, or three acres to the kids, one acre each, and three acres to the town. It's, it's, it's pretty onerous. That's why Tyler's saying, we don't, it's already bad enough that you have to give half your land when you do a major subdivision. Don't make it worse by having all these small subdivisions fall into this rule, too. So that's Tyler's side of the argument. He doesn't want these smaller subdivisions. So for your kids, it's at one time. So if you want to create two lots uh, right now, under the new rules, you can't do that. If you create one lot at a time, you can come see me this month, we create a lot. Come see me next fall or next spring or next month, you create another lot. But if you try to do multiple lots at a time, there's going to be a restriction on the permit. We have to conserve half your land. So we could do it one lot at a time. Yes. Right now you can do it Without two lots losing at a time. our... Yes. Land. Right now you can do two lots at a time. This change makes it one lot at a time. So this further tightens that uh, that the regulation. So right now no more two lots at a time. It's one lot at a time only. So it's, I assume you're against the proposal. Huh. Yes. Everything you've, what you've said tonight and what you've talked about, about trying to, to concentrate the housing and the development on on paved roads rather than dirt roads would easily lead to, to uh, corruption. If a board did not want one person to be able to have a subdivision or give out lots, and another person would be able to do it. Not only that, but that is about as wrong as anti-American as anything I have heard. And I hope that this is not approved, that you could confiscate our land. Thank you, Ed. Susan on Zoom, you have a question, fire away. I feel like a talk show host, this is fun with the Zoom part. Susan on Zoom, are you on mute? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. So uh, this is uh, something that you moved passed pretty quickly, which was 612 notice. Uh, and I would just say as a property owner in the village, 
with a proposed major development proposal in an adjacent proper, property that I strongly uh, support keeping the 15 day notice for abutting property owners. Um, I feel like the developer already has a long runway to get their ducks in a row and you have plenty of notice. And I think that we whose investments and the value of our uh, adjacent properties are impacted, that 15 days is really almost no time for us to understand the proposal and prepare ourselves to respond. So I would really urge the select board to keep the current 15 day uh, window for adjacent property owners. Thank you, Susan. Any other questions on, well, that's back to 612. Any other questions on uh, 710? Thank you. Anyone else on 710? We'll remove past 710. So 720 to 760 to 810 are all kind of uh, in the zoning bylaw uh, subdivision rules uh, realm. Uh, 720, to 660, 720 to 760, there's a bunch of minor small changes to the subdivision approval process. Just clarifying the two-step process. A uh, lot of different small changes, nothing really significant there. And section 810, which is accompanying it, is uh, there's a new subdivision standard. We're adding town plan compliance now that we have a really good town plan to uh, to one of those subdivision decisions that the DRB makes when they issue a subdivision. Any questions on that? What are you, what are you changing? Uh, the eight, section 810 is the uh, the really the change. It basically the DRB has to conclude that a subdivision complies with the town plan. That wasn't in there before. There's no nexus between the zoning and the town plan in terms of does this meet the town plan. So if a proposed project really contravened the town plan, the DRB could take exception to it and potentially reject an application or condition it so it better met the town plan. Any questions on that? Seeing none, moving on to section 820.4. So uh, this is a bit nitty gritty. We're offering more specific diameter guidance for cul-de-sac sizing and giving the DRB some flexibility there. So um, right now it's kind of one size fits all for cul-de-sacs and the fire department does not respond with a one size fits all truck. In a small development, they're going to uh, send a smaller truck and a big development with bigger buildings. They're gonna, maybe in the village, they'll send a bigger truck. So we're trying to, we worked with the uh, fire chief Denny on this. So we're trying to make sure that if the fire truck's not gonna send the giant ladder truck out there, we're not gonna require a cul-de-sac uh, that big. So I think it's 75 feet diameter and a uh, hundred foot diameter, but it no longer paints our cul-de-sacs with one size fits all brush. We're now sizing the cul-de-sacs based on the zone they're in and based on how the fire department's going to respond. So that's a good change. Any questions? And that's making sure we're not eating up your land for a larger cul-de-sac that's needed for the fire department when they're not going to bring the ladder truck. So I think you'd like that one. Um, section uh, 820.5, uh, we're codifying the existing process for naming a new subdivision roads, and this board actually plays in largely with that. So uh, when there's a new subdivision proposed, the developer uh, has to provide proposed names. Uh, Mayflower Field, uh, Mount Elmore, Grazing Lane, Lane whatever, whatever the road names would be. The select board, this board, creates and approves those names. At the same time, the select board is supposed to provide the developer with indication is this going to be a town road? Does it serve a town public purpose? Or is this going to be a private road that really doesn't, we're not going to take over? If it's a five house dead end cul de sac road, there's a pretty good chance the town's not that interested in taking over because it doesn't provide a public access point. However, if this new road's going to cut between the most recent one I can think of is Center Road and Route 15, and people are going to, the public in general is going to use this as a cut through, the town's going to take this over and they'll give the nod to the developer, yes, we'll going to look at this and, and potentially accept as a town road to build the standard because it serves a public purpose. However, if you're doing a three lot subdivision off Cram Road somewhere, we're probably not gonna take it. So developer is free to uh, plan for a 16 foot wide road, the public road, uh, minimum travel lane width versus the 20 feet plus two foot shoulders on each side for a town road. So this is the select board's chance to indicate to the developer, hey, we think this is gonna be an important road and you should do it to town road standards, you want us to take it over. But if they're saying this doesn't appear to be a road that serves a public purpose, the, the, the indication is the developer will only build a 16 foot wide private road because it's not gonna be taken over by the town. So the developer really appreciates that feedback in the process because 
When you design a project, if you're doing a stormwater analysis, a 16 foot wide road is very different than 24 feet. It's a lot more stormwater, a lot more expense. So the developer generally wants an indication before they go design everything, before they paint anything, before they build everything. Um, and again, it's not binding. The select board saying, hey, this is an important road. Uh, if it's a town road, we're gonna consider taking it. But if it's a really quiet residential road, a dead end road, we're probably not gonna take it. Gives the developer the needed feedback they need to show the plans a 16 foot wide road or a 24 foot wide road. And the road standards accordingly for private versus the town road, they're pretty different. There's a big cost difference there for the developer. Currently, we we're just uh, approve, approving the name of the road or the street or whatever, and we're not in the process of um, talking, push, pushes you that way. talking to talking to the developer because then we have to know a lot more information before we give them that we decide on that. It seems to to be asking us to do something before we have all the information. This pushes, this, this pushes you towards trying to figure out earlier in the process if it's going to serve a public purpose, this road or not. It's pretty obvious generally, if the road's off Cram Road, it's not gonna serve a public purpose. It doesn't need to be a big town wide road because <coughs> seven people drive on Cram Road a week. Um, not to pick on Cram Road, but if this is gonna be a new road, like the one off Upper, Upper Munson Ave, which is gonna be, right now exists to the credit union only, it's gonna loop through to Center Road. That is a road that people are gonna use heavily. It's gonna have hundreds of cars, if not thousands of cars a day. That's a road where it's pretty obvious to select for when they name it, when they come and finish a new section, which could be soon, uh, potentially, you're gonna say, hey, we're naming this road, it's probably gonna be a public road, uh, you should design it to town road specs, if you meet the specs, and we'll have a hearing later, we'll make the decision later, but chances are when it's a public road, we'll take it over. So it should be pretty obvious based on where the road is and what the use of it's gonna be, if you're gonna take it over or not. This board needs to work on its town road policy, there are a bunch of exceptions out there, it's pretty cloudy right now, so that's a later project, um, but Generally, it's pretty obvious, and if you're looking for a recommendation from me, I'm usually at the, at the meeting, or at least uh, there when you do the road names. I can give you a recommendation if need be. But yes, I mean, it is important to the developer. I mean, if they're asking me, well, is the town gonna take this or not? I mean, I have no clue, it's up to the select board. So that's their chance to get in front of the select board when they do the naming policy to get an indication which fork in the road to take, because it's a really big fork, private road or town road. There are big development on-site changes and cost changes based on which fork of the road they're taking there. And that's your first chance to give the developer, is this gonna be a town road potentially, or is this gonna remain a private road? And they'll draw their plans accordingly. Because that road naming is at the very start of the process. You name the road before the DRB approves something. Because the permits have to have a name to attach them to. I can't name, I can't attach permits to unnamed road. It's gotta have a road name. So at that point you give the developer, this is the way we're headed. Doesn't mean you're gonna get there ultimately, but that's the way we're headed. Does that help? Any questions on that one? Uh, let's see, uh, section 900, this will be the fun one. We're revising definitions for fence. Um, that's a pretty simple one. We had a, we had a uh, project recently where a developer is using concrete waste blocks for a fence and the town said that's not a fence so we're now codifying, unfortunately, what a fence has to be because a concrete waste block was not desired by the DRB or the neighbors as a legitimate fence. So, uh, many of the definitions like this, you get to a real-world application and someone thought waste blocks were a good fence and the neighbors and the board didn't disagree, disagreed. So now you tweak the zoning to make sure that you say what a fence has to be made of and concrete waste blocks is not one of the things you can make a fence out of. So definition changes for fence, recreational vehicle, short-term housing, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about ad nauseum here, uh, special industry, storage trailer, primitive camp. We talked about primitive camp earlier. Uh, we're deleting the preliminary, preliminary plat definition. We don't use that as part of the process. So, are these, so these are definition changes. We're revising certain ones. Can you go back to the sure, fence. Fence. Fence is the first one. Okay. We're adding that specificity to what a fence is for the first time. So we don't end up with concrete waste blocks as a fence. <laughs> Next one's recreational vehicle. Uh, the one after that, short-term housing. That's under section 900 in the warning. I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Recreation vehicle. And then short-term housing. This is a big responsibility. Okay. Special industry, mm -hmm. storage trailer. Um, special industry. Mm -hmm. And we're adding primitive camp and we're deleting primary plat, preliminary plat, excuse me. 
of the changes here, really the short-term housing ones, the big one, the only one that's really major. You're eliminating what? Preliminary plat, it's not used. We don't have a preliminary plat process. It's an old definition that's okay. vestigial, doesn't need to be there. We're deleting plat and deleting, and we're changing permanent camp? We're adding primitive camp. That's a new definition. Okay. So the big one here is the short-term housing one. So there are people here who want to speak about short-term housing. I'm sure there'll be a line. So uh, this is one of those rules where the town and the village have different definitions for uh, what can be allowed for short-term housing. In the village, you are limited to uh, only short-term short -term renting your, where you live, your primary property. In the town, you can buy as many houses as you want, run as a business. You can own 18 houses in the town, 25 houses, two houses, whatever the number would be, and run them as a short-term mini hotel business. Uh, that's not allowed in the village. So for the last five years, tw uh, twice before, this rule has gone to the select board. The select board struck it down. It may do so again. We'll see. In the village right now, you can only short-term rent one property. So if I live at 100 X Street, I can only short-term rent properties on that street. I can't go buy my neighbor's house and buy my neighbor's neighbor's house and then have run it as a business. The intent of the regulation is, uh, the owner part is we want people accountable to their neighbors. Uh, there's gonna be a party every weekend at some house. The neighbor is supposed to be living there too and dealing with it as well. So we're not just sticking someone with a bunch of out-of-towners and the primary homeowner is own seven places and can't keep track of them and, and, it's, and it's like whatever to the neighbors because it's just one of their portfolio. So in the village, you can only primary rent, you can only short-term rent at your primary property. In the town, the select board has struck down that rule before, so you can own as many as you want in town. You can start buying housing and the, we're trying to do this, the planning council will want me one more time to see if we can get these aligns, these rules to align. As we discussed before, no one really knows where, well, few people know where the village and town ends. So most people, when they're buying a property and they want to short-term rent it, they have no idea if they're on Cottage Street, if it's can do it or not do it, or on Brooklyn Street or Harold Street. I mean, one section of Harold Street's a village, and one section's a town. It's a lot more complicated than people think where the town and village lines are. Uh, so it's it's not an arbitrary rule, but it comes close. Um, and again, the Planning Council's tried this twice before to put the restrictions on the town. And really, it gets harder and harder every time as more percent, a larger percentage of our housing stock becomes short-term rentals. If you go on their website called uh, AirDNA, it tracks like VRBO and Airbnb. Uh, our short-term rental listings are growing at 9% per quarter, not per year, per quarter. So every quarter, 9% of our housing stock is going from permanent housing to short-term housing. And that only drives up the cost of housing and only drives the need for more development because we need to find houses for people or apartments for people that can't afford houses anymore or the houses became short-term rentals so they're forced to find somewhere else to live. I can tell you that story dozens of times where this has happened to people. Long-term rental, it's now a short-term rental. They need housing, and they have to build a new apartment building for them, or the price of housing is accelerating because of housing is being deemed not as just an investment and something you have over your head, but it's an income stream. The income stream is where the planning council is proposing this rule again. So to if you have a short-term rental in the town, if you have five in the town, you're okay. You're grandfathered. You just keep, with this rule in effect now, you can't buy more. You can't buy a sixth house, a seventh house, an eighth house, and run as a business. We're saying we need these homes for people to live in, people to work in our community, and to be neighbors. So that's the proposal. And again, this has been on the books in the village for five years. The select board has struck it down previously, a different board here. I'm not sure what they'll do, obviously, and I'm sure they're happy to hear comments about it. The one thing I rehearsed tonight. Come on up, next. Come on up. So my understanding of the village rules is that if you own a house, you're the primary owner, you can have an existing house that you can rent. Is that correct? Correct. For example, my house, I can short-term rent either my house or my accessory apartment or my tiny house. It's owner-occupied. So I have that property. I, I have my property at X Street where I can do short-term rentals, but I can't go buy other houses and try to turn those into short-term rentals. So I can't convert more long-term housing into short-term housing. It's not on my own property. And so the proposal before you, bef what has been presented by the Development Review Board, is that that will hold true in the town as well? Correct. It's rules in the village for many years now. Hasn't been much of an issue. We're asking for the town to have the same rules. Right. And the town, the select board previously, liked the grandless growth aspect and liked the... Uh, we want people building more houses. I mean, there's a positive side to short-term rentals too. I mean, your pluses minus everything in life. 
in short-term rentals come in, they go to Lost Nation, they go buy beer, they go fill their gas tanks, they shop at our grocery stores, they add vitality to the town, they add revenue to the town. Uh, the question is striking that balance, I think. So do people that live here. <laughs> Agreed, yes, obviously. So, anyway, thank you for the clarification. You're welcome, thank you. So you're saying that um, people currently who have Airbnbs and that type of short-term um, rental are grandfathered in? Correct. Zoning changes on the whole are always forward-looking. Zoning doesn't look back. So anyone who has anything tonight that's contrary to what's on the books, what's on the books being proposed, if it's already they're doing it, they are a grandfathered non-conforming use. They can, as long as they keep using that use, they can continue indefinitely. Zoning just draws a line in the sand now and says moving forward, these are the new rules, but everyone that was falling under the old rules can still use that, but they just can't buy more houses. Yeah. Allison Lane on Zoom, please fire away with your question. Hi, um, I'm Allison Lane from Morrisville, and I have a question, Todd, at um, the Planning Commission meeting, you mentioned something about an exemption on housing for a certain number of, that, that have a certain number of bedrooms. Can you um, just clarify that? Sure. So if you look at our definition, the back of the zoning bylaw for short-term housing, uh, it's multi-tiered. And basically it says if uh, four bedrooms or less is exempt from, it's not as exempt as the way it's written from owner occupancy, but it's exempt from the need for a permit. So if you're renting, uh, let's say you live at whatever street and you're going to go away to Bermuda for the Christmas and New Year's and good for you and you want to short term rent your house to a bunch of skiers for five, 10 grand while you're gone, that's totally okay. Uh, that's totally valid going forward with or without the zoning change. Um, but if the you're renting four bedrooms or less, you're good, you don't need a permit. If you're renting five bedrooms or more, it requires a permit. What they're really trying to get at is most houses in town are four bedrooms or less. So if we want to short term rent any of our homes here in the meeting in the room. We all want to go to Bermuda, get away from winter for a little bit and short term rent our house. No permits required, four bedrooms or less. But if it's five bedrooms or more, it goes to the DRB, Development Review Board, and then the neighbors get notified. <coughs> what we're trying to push back on is large party houses. Uh, people, when you're stuffing 30 people in a house and there are a bunch of kids from Massachusetts, New Jersey, and they're here to send it for the weekend and a complete party and ski, and they're gone and they're, they leave a wake behind them, a wake of whatever you want it to be, of usually negative consequences. So we're trying to let everyone who has a normal size house rent it without short term without a without a permit but if you're renting more than four bedrooms there's a there's more permit requirements there's a hearing with the drb your neighbors are invited so we're trying to encourage people to not have larger airbnbs have smaller size because if i have a four bedroom house next to me right now and it's short term rented or long term rented the impact's still a four bedroom house because there's going to be eight ten people there maybe three people there but if that four bedroom house suddenly has 30 people in it, that's a different kettle of fish in terms of impact to me and my neighbors or the surrounding neighbors. When you have three people in the house at whatever street and suddenly there are 30 people there every weekend, that's a different impact. Traffic, noise, everything else comes with it, trash. So the intent is to grandfather re regular homes, uh, the use of our homes or short-term rentals, but to make more permit requirements and more hoops to jump through for larger houses to make sure the neighbors' voices are heard regarding potential impacts and to make sure we can, uh, the board can help mitigate those through the public comment and approval process of the zoning board hearing. So the um, the permit for more than four bedrooms is would be totally separate from this new um, this new requirement that would say that you can only have one um, one. You or one home that you can Airbnb. Is no, that correct? I, no, I actually would disagree with that. Um, <laughs> what the, if you read the definition, the owner occupancy is a requirement, so you can only short term rent your primary property in town. Regard, but the uh, there's separate permit requirements for the size of the Airbnb, but there's still the owner occupancy is the prior is the uh, primary part in the equation in that sentence. So uh, just because you can't just because they're all four bedrooms or less doesn't mean you can still buy 20 houses in the town. You, could, you have one primary property, your primary Morristown, Morrisville property. You can short-term rent. You can no longer, if the zoning change goes forward, start buying a third house, a fourth house, and a fifth house and short-term renting them. Okay, so they all have to be owner-occupied, but if it's more than four bedrooms, it needs to go through a permitting process. Correct, exactly. We all get one property we can short-term rent. 
Uh, well, you don't get more than that going forward. Um, but if it's a larger property, regardless if you're one or not, um, it goes to the DRB and the neighbors get heard regarding impacts to a large short-term rental. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hope that was clear. Mr. Wilson. Ed Wilson, Fraser Road. I, I'm gonna forget half of what I really wanna say here, but I think uh, in terms of your comment that the, uh, that the planning is a forward-looking thing, I can see where there's merit in that, but I think it's pretty presumptuous of the board or, uh, or planners to know what the future holds for different people and different situations. We have two residential housing units. The, if, if we wanted to sell one of those, and it can't be Airbnb or short-term rental, the, the price of, the value of that goes down tremendously. Correct, that's part I of the mean, reason for this. And, and one of the reasons for this is to help with short term, so that uh, these houses won't be turned into uh, short term housing, uh, so that people don't have long term rentals. That's one of the thoughts behind it, right? Yeah, the, I mean, you're right. You are financially impacted. If you can't sell your house as a short term rental, it's worth less. Houses are being priced at the income stream, they can be made a short term rent. Short term rental is not a house to live at, work at, and be part of the community at. So that is part of it. So if the board does choose to restrict short term rentals to your primary uh, property in town, you are impacting the price, the market value, and I think more than theoretically, you are impacting the market value of those prices, houses going forward, because uh, it takes part of the market away. That Joe investor who wants to buy multiple houses for short-term rentals, isn't gonna buy that house anymore. He's gonna go shop in Hyde Park or shop somewhere else instead. So if something happened to my, my wife or I, or for whatever reason, we needed to sell that house, you've made it less valuable. We bought that a long time ago, and we weren't intending to use it as an Airbnb, but now that you've precluded that use, so that's impacted us. Right. The idea about having long-term rental housing so that more people can live in these homes might be a good idea, but how, why should private land and homeowners be burdened with the task of providing long-term rentals for the community? If you want to see that housing increased, you shouldn't put it on the backs of a certain group. Ask people if they want their taxes increased. If you say to people today, uh, do you want this restricted, the, only, the, the, the Airbnbs restricted, the people who don't have Airbnbs would be happy to vote for it because if they don't have any skin in the game, it's not gonna cost them a thing. You're, you're burden, burdening one specific group. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a horrible way to uh, try to achieve a public good. Thank you, Ed. And, nah, one more. Remember, just me, I'm just the, I'm just the messenger here. I'm not looking yeah, just yeah. at you, I'm looking at everybody. Here. Come on. I just work here. Go ahead. As far as the party house goes, I don't care if it's a two bedroom house, a four bedroom house, a 10 bedroom house. I don't care if it's an Airbnb or your long term neighbor. We have ordinances against that. Enforce them. If that's what's going on and you have a specific problem, take care of it. If there's a problem with a homeowner that does this uh, consistently, make rules or whatever to take care of that problem. But don't cover everyone who wants to have a, a nice place or a nice business. Don't, don't cover them with the same blanket. That's it for now. Thanks. Thank you.
Um, so Mariah Stokes, Sterling Valley. I'm short. Let's see. There we go. Um, I have skin in the game. I have had skin in the game with Airbnbs in Sterling Valley in the house, which I currently reside in since 2017. And when we purchased our home, we were, I think, the only short-term rental in Sterling Valley since purchasing our home. Every single house, and this could be a fact check where maybe one or two were not, but every single house that has sold in Sterling Valley from Stagecoach to where I live, which is almost to like Moran Loop, has become a short-term rental. So that's the reality. I love um, our neighbors. We have two neighbors in our little like three house area, um, but they are both in Massachusetts and they're wonderful people, but one is a business. So now I have a full-time business that's next door to me. So whether that is a four bedroom home or a five bedroom home that's a short term rental, whether they're partiers or they're the nicest people and they're quiet and don't make a peep. Those aren't, that's not a single family living in a single family home. That is a 24 seven business that cannot be regulated. It can't even fall under the home business. That's what I was asking Todd. So it can't be regulated that way. So what we're saying is it's a business but it's not a business and it's not even a home business. It's a short-term rental. So my hope is that this does go forward, that it does um, to some degree restrict short-term rentals. Um, I was quoted in the newspaper with the shorter leash comment. I think that's great. I like the analogy. I like that we have leash laws at certain trailheads so that dogs can continue to use those trailheads, but also people who maybe don't want to be accosted by dogs can use those trailheads without it impacting their, their trail use. I would love to see more restrictions on short-term rentals. I would love to see owner occupancy definitions that actually apply to the residents who live in this community so that people like Ed Wilson could maybe have a louder voice because he's a resident and he could have specific rules that apply to residents who wanna have short-term rentals. You could do owner occupancy by the voter checklist or something like that. Exactly, So, um, or number of days that you reside within the house. Um, I just feel that this is one step in the right direction. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? I hope we take this bite. I hope that people who are for short-term rentals understand that I am too, but not at the deficit of our community. And I think we all still wanna look at each other in the eyeballs in the grocery store and recognize one another, not have restaurants that are thriving because people can get their butts in the seats but don't come back to that restaurant because they can't get good service because there's no wait staff. Um, I wanna see more kids in schools getting a good education and teachers who feel supported because we have staff that can work in the schools and the teachers can live in the communities where they work. Um, I have a lot of things to say. I'm not gonna say them all and waste everybody's time, but I just, I do believe that while there's money to be made and there's a forward-looking approach to what short-term rentals could be, I don't think it's short-term rentals versus long-term rentals being provided. I think that long before Airbnb came along, if you wanted to turn a dollar, you sold your house and somebody bought it and then they lived in it. So I'd like to see more of that happening. And I think that it's gonna get harder and harder for people to compete dollar for dollar when they're trying to buy a home and somebody else is coming in trying to buy a business. So that's all I have to say about that right now. Thank you. Uh, Selena Rooney on Zoom. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm really opposed to the change to short-term rentals. Um, when I first heard that Burlington was doing this, I was really shocked. It just seems like a socialist move to me. I feel like it's taking away some of the freedom of homeowners by telling them who they can and can't rent to. I don't feel like it's the homeowner's job to provide housing to people. Um, I feel like people should be able to do with their houses what they want to do with them. Um, I do think there needs to be a line drawn between is it somebody's house or is it an actual business? Obviously, if somebody's got 15 short-term rentals in stow, that's a business. So I think we do need to figure out where to draw the line. If you're looking at um, 
business in terms of income, it looks to me like if you have three short-term rentals or more, that is considered a business because of the amount of income that you're making. Um, I think that short-term rentals allow residents to get a piece of the tourist pie. And, you know, we put up with tourists all year long. I think that we should be able to, to get a little bit of a payback for what we have to deal with during the leaf keeping season. Um, I've looked at a lot of the different states and their reactions to what they're doing with short-term rentals. And um, most states, this has gone to the state Supreme Court. And there's a lot of court cases out there. I think before we make any rules, we should really look at what those rules are that are actually being um, held up by state Supreme um, Courts. I also feel that the short-term rental market is going to regulate itself. People aren't going to come to Morrisville if there's no good restaurants um, because we don't have long-term rentals for the staff at the restaurants to work with. I think it's going to work itself out. I don't think that the short-term rental market is going to be going this hard um, with the recession and with interest rates going up. It looks to me like it's going to be going the other way eventually. I mean, people have a lot of extra money right now with all the COVID cash that was thrown out here and there. So I think that's going to come to an end soon and we're not going to see such a huge need for short-term rentals in the area. Um, but again, that's something that's probably going to work itself out. I do think it's a good option for those of us that have an extra house to be able to rent something out short term um, because it is so hard to um, kick somebody out when you have a long term rental and the person isn't paying and they're trashing the house. And we've seen repeatedly in Lamoille County that that's a real issue, that landlords really don't have any rights and that um, it's hard to rent, find a good long term renter that's not going to create problems. So, again, I just want to reiter reiterate that I am um, opposed to the changes to short term rentals. Thanks. Thanks. We have a comment. Uh, another Zoom. Oh, Wally is there first. Let's do Wally first. Wally Reed. And then I have two Zoom people after Wally. Wallace Reeve on Jersey. I'm not going to speak to the volatility of short term rentals. Just if there is a permit process for five bedrooms or more, if you could put in some safety inspections, because right now these are business with no state requirements. That they're actually in the uh, five bedroom or existing, they require a, uh, I believe, a um, occupancy permit from the Division of Fire Safety. So, Sean Fidel will be walking through the property. Thank you. Yes, four bedrooms or less, no, five bedrooms or more, there is a that safety part. Come to the microphone, please, and then we'll go to the Zoom questions. All right. Yeah, uh, all yep. set. Scott Thompson, Morseville. Uh, I have my head in with the Vermont State Housing Authority, Section 8, HUD, um, Department of Mental Health, Howard Center. I got quite a bit of packet behind my experience. Um, do you people in this bedroom realize that these apartments going up are probably uh, $2,200? and that they don't qualify for Section 8, Shelter Care Plus, or any of those? You're saying that, Miss. You're shaking your head like you have a last name at Gamroff. Would you like to exp express your concerns to me while I'm standing here? We're talking to people that need housing. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, sir. Okay, and thank I'm you. Well, that's active, from me active. to Tom Sympatico, PhD, MD, psychiatrist. Thank you. That, but I, I want everybody at this to, to be aware of this, okay? $2,000 to get into one of Graham Mink's apartment, no car, Medicaid and Medicare, yeah. eligible Scott, for this and that. Scott, um, we're, I think all of us up here are very aware of what you're talking about. Unfortunately, this, I work is, some real good this isn't the place for us to be talking about this right now. Well, Thank it falls you. under HUD and housing, so that's the way I feel, and I think right. the public needs to be aware of it. Thank because you. Because I have the knowledge, and I can get Dr. Sympatico in here. Thank you. I just want to make it clear that when I'm nodding my head when someone's speaking, that means I'm being an active listener. Uh, there's a Nancy on Zoom. We need your last name to speak. Nancy, the floor is yours. Is she unmuted? 
Why don't we move on to Laura Streets. Laura on Zoom. Laura, floor is yours. Hi. Um, basically, um, living in a neighborhood uh, and having lived in all these major cities that are now uh, writing very, very strong laws against Airbnb, a house that um, is not owner-occupied for more than two months is a business. Two months is technically a timeshare. Um, that's always been my concern. Um, and I, I think the owner definition right now is you're setting it up that it's allowing people to have a house that they never live in. Um, and therefore they are renting it out on short term and it becomes a business. And then it reduces the value of the neighborhood of the next door neighbor's pay, uh, properties and quality of life because they are now living next to a transient um, business. And so I hope that I've been fighting this for five years, and I hope that um, the select board and the trustees protect our quality of life here. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Laura is correct that the uh, owner occupancy definition is actually, we've never got it through the select board before. It's, a, it's pretty weak. So it allows one property in town, your property, be a short-term rental, but it doesn't say you have to even live in town. You could be Scott from New York City. You buy one house in, 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 out in Mud City in Morrisville, and you can short-term rent that and never show up here, but you're only limited to one. So it's not, um, it is restrictive. It's not completely restrictive. It doesn't shut down short-term rentals. Every property still can be short-term rented, even if you never step foot in this town, but you only do one. You said owner-occupied in your definition. The definition is your one property in town. We basically decided to, we did real, the planning council discussed this, many iterations of owner occupancy. We did, we talked about voter checklists, thought that'd be too restrictive. We talked about your primary property, but we thought that'd be too restrictive. It, 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 um, sorry, uh, got lazy, put it on my knee. I apologize, it's getting heavy, long meeting. Um, so the owner occupancy definition, we talked about restricting it to voter checklist. You gotta be a voter here to show you're an owner. We thought that was too restrictive because let's say you live in Boca and you live there seven months a year and you're here five months a year because you're a snowbird. So we preclude you and those people want to be able to rent their homes and we thought it was overstepping a government reach to say, you can't rent your home just because you're in Florida six months in a day. So we settled on a weaker version. It's it's your one property in town. So everyone can rent one property, just can't start buying. If this passes, you can't just buy more properties and turn them into a mini hotel business. But anyone who's doing, if you have two properties now, and you've short-term rented before the date this hearing was warned, you're grandfathered, you're good. Just stop buying housing for short-term housing. I mean, short-term rentals and you're okay. Okay, we're gonna take a couple more and then we're gonna close it off on this one. So two more people wanna speak. I have a Nancy on Zoom who doesn't have a last name. You'll need to provide your last name to speak. Deniman. Thank you, Nancy, go ahead. Uh, my husband and I moved here from Colorado and a very similar size town to Morrisville. And it was a real problem with Airbnbs. Uh, not only did it create shortage of housing for people who lived and worked in the Valley, but it also increased rent. Um, people couldn't compete. The main problem is it causes a disruption. And this is documented that 90% of the police uh, calls that they go out on are to short-term rentals. Uh, they abated the problem by setting a cap. There was a certain number that they allowed per, per the town and you had to register with the local government. If your house became a problem, you could lose your lease and ability to rent short-term housing. And I would like to see Morrisville go in that direction. Um, the reason why we moved here was we were looking for a small community where you do know the person that you're passing in the grocery store instead of uh, a lot of transient problems. The problem is with people doing short-term rentals who don't live in the community is your neighbors are having to put up with all the problems with noise and and garbage and whatever else that's going on. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Sheriff Marku, come on up. Uh, 
Thank you. And I'm here in my capacity, not as the sheriff tonight. So, Mr. Uh, Marku, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I support short-term housing. Um, I had a conversation with Don uh, this afternoon, and he asked a question that kind of took me off guard a little bit. Is uh, what do you think? What would you do? And I've been thinking about that and listening to both sides of what everybody said. Um, one thing is I am not really very, very um, up to speed on what the, the long-term housing problem is. I know that uh, some people don't have, uh, uh, you know, businesses have a hard time finding help and everything, but I don't know where these people are all staying now. I do know that in the county, there's about 250 to under 300 homeless people. So that's more of the, the realm that I'm familiar with. Um, Ed Wilson brought up a, a point. If, if we, on, on our property up there, um, when my in-laws retire from farming and we've got two extra houses and this is a done deal tonight, then we are restricted as to what we can do with that property. And, and I, I really honestly don't believe uh, that we should be uh, limited into you know, what, what we might be able to do to help pay the taxes and everything up there. Um, but Don, to your point, what I think I would do on this subject, because uh, even though I'm pro short-term housing, is I would ask the board to consider parceling this issue out, getting a group of people on both sides of the aisle together to, to talk about things like locals versus out-of-state businesses coming in, uh, uh, you know, limiting housing or limiting the number of houses. Um, see what we can come up with collectively with, with some folks that have maybe more time uh, than you do uh, to, to further look into it. And I know that the Planning Commission has worked hard. And that's quite a slate of, of items that they've worked on and you have to go through. But I think that this could impact so many people that I really think that what's the harm in, in getting people from both sides of the aisle to, to sit down and take a look at this to see you know, if there's compromise that could be struck where people that are from the area and are just trying to get into another business uh, um, you know, have the opportunity to do so. Uh, it would mean a lot to us in our area up there. We've got a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, tourists that come up uh, mountain biking and what have you, and, and we like seeing them around. And uh, you know, uh, we don't have the same problem as Colorado. Uh, the, the law enforcement agencies don't spend their time dealing with short-term housing. I can guarantee you that about Lomoyle County. Uh, we've got other, other issues. So, um, so that's pretty much what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any more short-term rental homes? Short-term short -term housing. Yeah. David Ring. I'm not sure if this actually affects what I'm going to talk about because... Um, Maybe this already applies in the village, but maybe I'd like a little clarification. Uh, if you live in a village and you are considered to be occupying your home and the neighbors comes up for sale, your neighbor's property, um, and it's currently rental property, it's lived in as a two unit complex or even a three unit complex or whatever it is. Um, what I hear you say is that as a, Person, I couldn't buy that and then continue that as a business or continue that as a rental because I'm only allowed one. Correct. You cannot buy the house and under the current rules and short term rent it, the neighbor's house. So you're saying that I cannot buy a neighbor's house that comes up for sale. You can long term rent it, just not short term. What's the difference? 30 days or less is short term. Okay. So it can be long term. Yeah. Right? Just, yeah, you can, you can buy the All neighbor's right. house and rent it long term just like it's always been, but you couldn't turn that into a short-term rental because you don't own, you, that's not your property. Right, so whoever's in there has to be living there more than 30 days. Correct, yes. Correct. Okay, yep. so that's what Thank I you. Think. Any more short-term rental comments? Okay. All right, last part of the uh, Warren zoning change. We're getting into the boundary changes, section 1000. So there are a few here. There are two main ones that I'd like to speak to first. Uh, Brooklyn Street is a couple of these. So. As we talked about before, I have maps if need be over here I can pass out. There's a section of Brooklyn Street from the rail trail. 
Pastor Neil. There you go. Okay. We have a couple here too. Thank you. Give me some for the select board. Thank you. Ryan, take one, pass it down, or share them, or. <coughs> You're welcome. So there's a small section of Brooklyn Street from the rail on the west side of Brooklyn Street, which is the truck route side, not the river side, uh, from the rail trail up towards Ace Glass, including the uh, funeral home, as you heard earlier, is being rezoned as part of this package. And they're going from medium density to high density residential. Really, the density is the same. The change is it allows multifamily use. As we heard from Ms. Faith earlier, uh, not to pick on her, but she's right in my sights here. So it happens you sit in the front row. Uh, the funeral home property is got Brooklyn Heights condos to the rear with, uh, I think, 30 units. Uh, it's got the other side, the other rear property line. It's got the Fenimore Street, Nick Donza development complex. So that's got 34 units. And to the north side, it's got a Donza apartment building with six units. And uh, right now, the existing, well, the existing zone before this change said the funeral home, if it's sold for residential purposes, it could be single family or two family only. That zoning change we talked about is kind of wasn't uh, it wasn't made with particular thought at the time of what the impacts were. It was part of the Fairwood Parkway change. Uh, regardless how we got there, we're here. So the issue is trying to fix the zoning for that section of Brooklyn Street. That section of Brooklyn Street, especially the west side, is predominantly multifamily. It's densely developed with multifamily. So the zoning change tries to match that. So these property, like the funeral home, can be used as a multifamily residential property. And the properties on that side of the street also remain conforming to zoning. So it takes the properties from the rail trail, except the Wickart property, uh, up towards the funeral home and puts them in the high density residential zone. The Wickart property is the one property that would not go HDR. That actually be part of the pink property to the cell to be part of the central business zone. So I think we've discussed this for half the year now, many, many, not many times. So I'd be surprised there's new information, but. Happy to talk about Brooklyn Street boundary zoning boundary changes if anyone wants to. Yes. I know somewhere in this packet is you've talked about the historical district. Yes. And you it's M D H, I think. More so historic districts? Yeah. Yeah, it's really the downtown. So is that is there any way this is off the topic? Any way that that could be added to the your rubric, your your key, that the MDH could be added to the key. Yeah, we do that. that it's, it's, yeah, yes, okay. that can be done. No problem. Any other questions on the Brooklyn Street zoning change? That was easier than I thought. All right, all right. Let's go to. Uh, let me do my notes over here. The other minor, less uh, significant zoning changes here is along the Jersey Heights neighborhood. So. Right now on the south side of Jersey House, the north side is where uh, the King House is and where the new development is between the between Jersey Heights, Route 100 and the river. Jersey Heights is like the police station. I don't have a map for that now. It's a really minor change. It affects a couple of, people, a couple of people's properties. So right now, the on the south side of Jersey Heights, the zoning boundary goes, in my opinion, too far into the residential neighborhoods, the single family home neighborhoods. This zoning change just pulls that line up ever so slightly so it's only the road frontage properties Route 100 that become multifamily. So right now, it's the road frontage properties and a couple houses on each street. Best Street, Audi Lane can go multifamily. This restricts the zoning, pulls that line closer to Route 100. So really, only those road property, road uh, frontage properties on Route 100 go multifamily. So the new zoning is uh, 200 feet on the south side of Jersey Heights can be HDR. Everything else is uh, low density residential. Right now, that HDR reaches further into the neighborhood. The zoning change pulls it back to protect those single-family neighborhoods. And the, the line, um, for those who can follow it in their head, the line right now that separates HDR around the Jersey Heights neighborhood from LDR, which is back towards the Jersey Way, the condos, and Foss Street, it's a line from the culvert that goes under Randolph Road, which is where the, board, where the potash enters into the Boardman Brook. That line right now goes from there directly across to the cul-de-sac of Sterling Court. So it includes all that area. That line is being pulled from that same culvert north to the intersection of really where the back line of where the, the, uh, the Irving gas station property is. So it's only 200 feet in. Right now it's a couple hundred feet in. It gets minimized, shrunk to 200 foot sliver on the south side of Jersey Heights for HDR. So it's meant to protect the neighborhoods from seeing large apartment developments in them. 
Any questions on that one? Lee, come on up. We can't hear you without the mic, Lee. You gotta come up for Zoom. Zoom rules, you gotta talk in the micro for Zoom. What happens when it borders Audi Lane and Route 100? If it's within 200 feet of Route 100 on the south side, it, you're good. So there's a section of Audi Lane still that could see multifamily development. It's at 200 feet. So 200 feet, the depth is 200 from Route 100, which is basically east-west running right there. 200 feet to the south of that is the HDR. After that is low density. Low density, single family only. H HDR, high density, allows multifamily. So that ribbon of HDR is being shrunk in width from a few hundred feet to 200 feet. So I see where there's a permit the for a nine-unit apartment building. Please, go to the microphone, please. I see where there's a permit for a nine-unit apartment building on that corner. Yes. Is that high density? That's, that would still remain high density. That permit's in before the zoning change, so it's under the old rules regardless. That'll be Wednesday night. That's my Wednesday night appearance. Which That's actually a much more contentious hearing than tonight, so that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, yes, either way, uh, that's under the old rules regardless, but even with the zoning change, that multifamily development on the corner of uh, Audi Lane and Jersey Heights right there is in the HDR zone before and after the zoning change. That'll be about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock on Wednesday. You want to join me then? Yeah. That's how I spend my nights. Clarify for me, please. I'm on Audi Lane. I'm on Mike. I'm on Audi Lane, and if you're coming 200 feet, from Route 100 down Audi Lane, is that gonna, gonna be on, on property lines that are already there, or is that gonna divide lots that are already there? It divide lots. It's basically 200 feet mine measure, measured from, the 200 foot measurements from the center line of Jersey Heights. So everything from the, right. if you take a tape from the yellow line on Jersey Heights and run it 200 feet into your neighborhood, that's where the, that's where the HDR versus LDR line is. So I don't know exactly where 200 feet is on the ground, but in theory, you could be dividing some lot, somebody's lot. You surely are. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of split lots in town. You really don't want to do, what you're saying is you would like to see the zoning boundary on along a property line. I'm saying that's a bad precedent to do because let's say I do the zoning line along your property, the neighbor, and you decide to sell 20 feet of your side yard to your neighbor. I'm not part of that process. The town isn't part of that process. You just affected a zoning change without any public review. So that's why we don't do property lines. We like to do set distances now, from physical features, we ravines, have, rivers, things like that. We have a state issued subdivision permit that says in our development, you cannot have more than a single family home on each lot. So you're saying if 200 feet comes into to my lot, you can take part of my lot and put it into the high density zone and I can't do a thing about it? Well, it's up to the select board and the trustees to approve the zoning or not. That, yes, that's but a yes. a different issue. Yes, but you the select board and trustee vote will impact usurp, your property if you're within you, 200 feet. You, can you serve a state-issued permit and give somebody permission to develop on a lot that the state has, has taken that permission away? They need both permits. They, the developer has to... Has to uh, make amends with many masters, the local zoning, uh, state permitting, if they're all building permits, Act 250, there's a lot of masters for a state, so no. I understand your question. Your question's more relevant to Wednesday night's DRB so, hearing for the development of Okay, if I understand what you're saying, yep. you can do what you want, and our permit from the state doesn't mean anything. A permit under town zoning, uh, the, the zoning is set for a 200-foot boundary, regardless of what your subdivision says, if the town zoning says you can do multifamily within that 200 feet, the DRB should permit that the property rights issues, the other permits of the right. developer to work so, out. So you could take our property against our will and build on it. No, there's no building on That's it. That's what you just said. No, you I disagree. take 200 feet from, from Route 100, 200 feet back on Audi Lane. Well, right, right now it's a few hundred feet. We're, we're, we're decreasing it to 200 foot. So we're, we're protecting the single family homes more with the zoning right. change. But if I own... If I own a lot that, that's, that's 150 feet from Jersey Heights, from Route 100. Yep. So high density you residential. You come in and say somebody can build on my lot, or I, I can build on that. You lot. Gotta, you got to sell it first against, against the state permit. 
No, they would need to they would need to make their make amends with the state permits too. They have many masters to meet, and it's a local permitting, state permitting, Act 250, wherever the permit authorities would be. They have to. Someone has to buy your land, and they have to. Correct. I got a I got a job for you, Mariah. You want? We'll trade. You did that better than I could. I don't think we heard any of that. Yeah. You have to say that because that's unnecessary structure. Understood. Yeah. That, yeah. No one can build on your land unless you sell it. Obviously, that's a separate DRB hearing on Wednesday night. Well, I'm not necessarily referring to my land, but that lot, whoever owns that lot. And build on it. The town would allow, uh, the town could permit a multifamily use, a high density use of that lot. It's within 200 feet of Jersey Heights if the zoning change goes through. Right now, the zoning change goes much further into the neighborhood. It's 400, 500 feet, whatever. It depends on where you take the measure, what side street you do. So we're intending to shrink the high density area to protect the single family neighborhoods, make sure they stay single family. We're trying to ensure that someone doesn't build an apartment building in the middle of Best Street or Audi Lane. Um, that's more likely to happen now in existing zoning. With the new zoning, if it's approved, uh, that will be less likely to happen. So that multifamily will only happen if it's within 200 feet of the street, uh, the center line of Jersey Heights, Route 100. On land that they have purchased. Correct, yes, on land they could purchase. No one's building in your backyard right now, I promise. Uh, those are the two main changes of the zoning boundary definitions. Uh, the others are small changes, for example, uh, in the central business zone, uh, we're, we changed the name to Feline Loop from A Street and B Street. The, the zoning district boundary uses those names. We update the district boundary. So we're all in section 1000. That's the last section we're talking about. We're talking section 1000. Sorry. I see where you're looking at. Central business, section 1000. It's the fourth one in. Zoning, sort of, no, second one in. So in the central business zone. Sorry, it's section 1000, central business. I don't know how to explain it better. Are you on appendix one? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm going off the warning. On the warning, it's section 1000. Sorry, I apologize. We're looking at two different documents. So these, these, the rest of these are small changes for central business. Uh, there are two changes part of central business. One we talked about already is a Wickart property on Brooklyn Street, the corner of Brooklyn Street and the rail trail is going from medium density residential to central business, and the other change in central business is uh, we re the select board renamed the road. They renamed uh, part of A Street or B Street into Feline Loop, so the zoning boundary definition has to reflect that. There's also a small change between uh, trading some land between the commercial zone and the industrial zone. Uh, right now, the Mountain View Plaza, which is Morrisville House of Pizza, is in the industrial zone. Uh, the intent of the zoning change is to split that property between the commercial zone and the industrial zone to give uh, the landowner and the town more uses of what that property looks like when it's redeveloped. Right now, that's really not an industrial property. It's functioning as a commercial property. It's zoned industrial. Uh, the zoning change splits that property in two, so it can be either commercial or industrial, depending on what the applicant proposes, what the DRB approves there. Because that property will be redeveloped at some point. Any other questions on zoning boundary changes? No? Yeah, I got it. Yes, Mr. Green, go ahead. Martin Green from Best Street. Um, I thought that the original proposed zoning change for the Best Street and the, that uh, HDR in Jersey Heights was just going to be 100 feet. Was, did I could understand be that correctly? I don't know. I could be quoting it wrong. I think I'm right, but you could be right. I'm wrong more than once a day. Oh, I'm over here. What am I doing? I keep doing that. I moved stuff over once. And I forgot it's over here. Uh, let's see. It's a linear distance. Uh, let's see. It would be an HDR and MDR. It's not quite the 200 feet. I was using that more as a number. It's really what I talked about. It's from the distance. It's the measurement from the culvert under Randolph Road where the Potash Brook flows of the Boardman Brook. It's pretty close to Bourne's equipment barn. Uh, right now, the line goes from there directly west to Sterling Court. So everything north of that line. So I'm drawing a line from the culvert here, Randolph Road, over to Sterling Court. Everything north of that is high density. This line, it's staying here on the right, on the, uh, on the east. 
at the culvert. Culverts don't move. They're great things to put zoning boundaries on. But instead of using Sterling Court, this line's being pushed up to um, the back property line of the Irving property. So there's, there's really a consistent boundary line in the back of all those properties. The Irving property, the townhouses are getting built there. If you look at the property line is common all the way across from 100, except for maybe two exceptions where the lot's been subdivided to two. So really it's the, it's not a set 200 feet, it's the measurement of the delta between the culvert to Sterling Court and the line's getting pushed further north towards 100 from Sterling Court to the back of the Irving property that line. So it's maybe close to 100 feet, it depends, it's variable. So the line on the east isn't moving, the culvert stays, so there's really not much definition change there, but the further you get from that culvert, the line moves more here, so it's a triangle, so there's more of a distance here. So the further west you get, the bigger the setback is, the, the zone is gets from Route 100, but we're trying to shrink that. So right now it's at Sterling Court, gets pushed up the street to really those commercial frontage properties. That's HDR only. We wanna see if there's, the Planning Council made the change to HDR in Jersey Heights a uh, handful, five years ago, four years ago now. Uh, they determined at the time, and the Select Board and Trustees approved it, that it was a good corridor for more multifamily housing. Uh, it's got transit lines, it's got water, it's got sewer, it's got a sidewalk coming. Um, so they determined there, but the intent wasn't to put multifamily into the neighborhoods. We're making sure, now that we're seeing lots of multifamily on that street, we wanna make sure the multifamily stays where it's envisioned on the Route 100 corridor not in the neighborhood, so that's the intent. So the line is, it's not straight to one, I've tried to simplify, it's not straight 200 all the way across, it's variable based on the triangle. The triangle starts here and gets wider as we get from Sterling Court, shrinks it down to the back of the gas station. Sorry to be too simplistic, but I can draw it for you really well. Any other questions on the boundary descriptions, or changes? Sterling Court? Sterling Court is the little cul-de-sac opposite of the Jersey Heights condos, there's a little, inter if you come off Route 100, onto Jer off Jersey Heights, onto Jersey Way, I don't know why we have the intersection of Jersey and Jersey, we do. So you're off Jersey Heights, onto Jersey Way, that first right, there's a daycare out there on the cul-de-sac, that's oh, Sterling okay. Court. So right now, everything north of Sterling Court is HDR, and that line's being pushed up significantly to the back of the gas station. So there's a couple properties, all that whole strip is there's properties that are HDR now that are going L LDR, single family only with a zoning change. Any other questions on that one? That's all that I have. That's the entire warning. The, uh, so the select board uh, is gonna take your comments into consideration. The trustees meet next week. The trustees meet on Wednesday at six o'clock. That's at the village offices. That room holds about 12 people. Um, so I would highly encourage you, and see if you wanna sit around a staff table or standing room only with 12 people, uh, get there early or Zoom the meeting. Or they, if they get a large turnout, they may change the location. But as of right now, it's a warrant for the village offices. And then the select board and trustees, they can't make any decisions at the public hearing. So this is a chance to listen and ruminate. The statute reads they can't vote on the zoning changes until their next regular meeting. So it sounds like the select board and trustees are going to meet December 5th to vote on this. And they're not voting? We're voting December 4th. Yes. So... Yeah, the, okay. you're, you're, they're not voting on the 5th, or you both are voting? Not on the December 5th. Okay. Trustees and the same night. Yeah. Okay, so they're not meeting, it's not a joint meeting that night. We're doing we're a joint meeting, meeting on the 30th. We're still oh, okay. On so, sorry for that. I had a little miscommunication there. The trustees and select board will have a joint meeting at some undetermined time, maybe the end of the month, and the select board is going to be voting on this at their meeting on December 5th. So. If the select board has to approve either what's proposed or they can leave things on the cutting room floor, they can say, I'm gonna approve changes 200 through 800, I'm not gonna approve sections 900 and 1,000. That's okay, but if they change things, then we have to do this over again in more public hearings. So they have to approve it as written or approve things without things that are written. So they could approve X, Y, and Z, but not B. That's okay and they can approve the zoning, but if they start to change things or change definitions, another public hearing would do this over again. So we'll see how the, uh, everything works out between the select board and the trustees, but ultimately both boards have to have one zoning bylaw, one document that says the same thing that both vote, a majority of both boards vote to approve. Question? What time is the meeting on December 5th? Six o'clock. Six o'clock, so in theory that's at the town offices? Mm -hmm. Yes. So get there early if you want to see it in that one too. Bob, come up to the mic so people can't hear you if you're not at the mic. Yes. Uh Bob Bortry again. I'd like to, can I address the board with just one final comment? Um, 
there's been a lot of work put into these changes. The Development Review Board spent two and a half years working on this. I don't think anybody got all that they wanted to get. Um, it's a give and take process. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of contention in the town right now over these very issues. And I would highly encourage the select board to adopt this proposal in its entirety. I think the worst thing that can happen in this process is if the select board and the village trustees start stripping things out of this proposal, I think that is going to create a, a great deal more animosity among town members. Uh, I, so I would ask all of us here in this room tonight, select board village trustees to think about what we want our community to look like. What do we want for our community? Now, I'm not talking next month or next year into the future, the decisions that we make now are going to have a lasting impact in the future of our community, our rural nature, and everything we all live here for. So I encourage you to adopt it in its entirety. Thank you. Anything you want to add to close out the meeting, select board members, Bob? My part of talking is done, hopefully, so the mic is yours. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing section of our meeting tonight, and I'm going to call the select board meeting to order at 8.57. First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions, Eric? No changes. Next, approve the minutes. The minutes of select board meeting 10.17.22. I have a motion by Brian and a second by Don. Is there any further discussion on these minutes? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? The minutes are passed. Now the minutes of select board meeting 11 one I have a motion to approve them by Brian. Do I have a second? Second by Don. Is there any further discussion on these? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? The minutes of 11 1 have been passed. Now we have liquor control. Do I hear a motion to go into liquor control? I have a motion by Judy and a second by Brian. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? We are now in liquor control. So the state of Vermont has decided after reviewing the law relative to tobacco. The word cannabis is here. However, this is about tobacco regulation, which falls under the jurisdiction of what control. So through the whole cannabis legislative piece, they've been read the statute on the regulation of tobacco, where for years they've taken it upon themselves to regulate tobacco and let liquor licenses to liquor control boards. They realized that they were working contrary to state state law. So they have now backed away, and even though it's Lamont County Cannabis, this is about the regulation of, or the sale of uh, paraphernalia, what we used to call it. Like, call it what you want to now. It's the pipes, uh, the bombs, you know, that kind of stuff. For that they need a permit for because it's for the use of smoking tobacco products. So Lamont County Cannabis has applied for a permit Lamont County Cannabis has applied for a permit to sell products that are used for smoking tobacco products. I'm not sure what you're asking. No, no, no. The, the pipes that they're selling in the marijuana shop are for smoking a tobacco product. Cannabis is a tobacco product. So the, the pipes and whatnot that were previously regulated by the state they're saying they don't have the right to do that. It has to be done through the local liquor control board. Yeah. 
yeah. I suppose you could put uh, black and mild, black and mild into your bong, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're not selling cigarettes. This is this is for the. I'm sorry, my law enforcement days calls it paraphernalia, but it's probably something else they they've described it as now. So inventory, right? So. So they're looking for approval on their permit for that. I make a motion we approve the um, tobacco license for Lamoille County Cannabis. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Judy and a second by Don. Is there any further discussion on this motion? So anytime we've ever done a liquor license, we give the, the license, but the state of Vermont oversees, if they don't give it, they don't get them, right? Yes, the tobacco sale or the, the sale of the products that are used to smoke tobacco uh, will be regulated and checked on by uh, the state liquor control officers, not by locals. We're just issuing the license, local license. Any further discussion with this motion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Do I hear a motion to come out of liquor control? I have a motion by Judy and a second by Don. All in favor say aye. aye. We are now out of liquor control. Next, approve the warrants. Do I hear a motion to move the warrants? I have a motion by Judy and a second by Don. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? We have now approved the warrants. Do I hear, is there any other business? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Judy, second by Don. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? We are now adjourned at 9.02.